millions of people have See me, but I don't hear anything. Oh, I just heard something. Let me do a sound check here. Can anybody hear me? Wave if you hear me. Can hear you, John. Okay. So, sounds like sounds like my microphone's working. So we'll wait a couple more minutes for more people to log on here. I just talked to a guy on the phone who, who couldn't get on, but then he, by the time I called him back, he, he discovered the way to do it. Um, and so it's a terrifying thing to realize, oh my gosh, you know, I put in the wrong password or something like that. But <laughs> it was 2111 this time, which is the number of twin cams built. Yeah. John, this is Kurt. Thank you very much uh, for calling back. But it was actually it was actually the problem here with me. Oh, it was, you know, it was one of those ID ten T problems. So uh, loose, loose nut behind the keyboard. What the? <laughs> what do you have? Okay, we've got. Uh, okay. We've got fifty eight people on. We got a couple more uh, minutes. Be before we're going to start, um, I've got uh, I've got some individual club shows that I'm doing, um, um, you know, for Zoom sessions like this, and then I don't make these incessant pleas for for uh, donations to my website because they pay me straight up. And the most recent one I got was from a guy in Israel. They've got an MG Car Club Israel, so I got to brush up on my Hebrew, I guess. Um, Anyway, I, I haven't chased that one yet to see if I'll, I'll be on that, but I'm the, there's a Toronto MG Car Club one coming up. I see Rudy's on, and uh, I'm, uh, that's about the only Rudy I know who spells his name like that. So I think that's Rudy from Toronto. So it'll be the Toronto and the Montreal and the um, Ottawa Club. So I'm there to brush up on my French. If, uh, if I'm, I'm going to include the the uh, Montreal group, so we're at 6:59, and everything's working out okay. We got 74 people on. I did not post this month this for this meeting on Facebook or um, MG Experience. I'm going to try a, a different way as soon as I'm off tonight. Put a note up on there and ask people to log into my website and put their name on the constant contact list. Just I, I'm terrified. After, I don't know how many of you were on for that one time we got Zoom bombed, um, but geez, you know, oh my gosh. Well, it's seven o'clock, so it's time to start the show. Is it um, better since is, you have the uh, passwords? I mean, there was I hear Rich Caldwell in the background here. So anyway. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to mute everybody so that we don't have any background noise. It's not because I don't want to hear, hear you, but I mute everybody. And then when I call on you or something comes up, you can unmute yourself and, and, and make a comment. We're going to run for two hours or until we run out of questions or two and a half hours at the, la at the latest. Uh, I would encourage everybody, thank you very kind. I sent a note out to all those who made a donation last year. Uh, maybe I can get my notes out a little earlier this year. But thank you to those of you who have made a donation on PayPal. That helps me out a lot. I appreciate it very, very much. I do a tiny, tiny amount of work in my shop. I've got rent to pay. I got to pay insurance. I just talked to my insurance man. And I said, well, I do these Zoom seminars. And he says, well, that's another 600 bucks a year in insurance. So that, you know, if I tell you to, I don't know, hook your battery up to your brake line, and then you go out and drive and, and get in a crash, um, and you sue me, I've got some, I've got some insurance protection uh, so you don't come and, and take my MGA away from me. So anyway, I do have expenses. 
I'm, the expenses that I incur from subscribing to uh, constant contact and uh, uh, this platform, Zoom, there's something. But anyway, all those donations help. They help cover my costs and give me a little money so I can buy some, some beer from time to time, pay my, my bills here too. So we got 99 people on right now. It'll, so, oh, there it goes. We're now, now we're up to 100. So I want to uh, want to go over some uh, quick metrics real fast on the YouTube, my YouTube channel, the University of Motors LTD with all the, all the videos, 300 and some videos up there. I've, I've got 19,983 subscribers to YouTube and my YouTube channel has 8,886,800 846 views as of a couple hours ago. So thank you very much for watching those videos because Google sends me a check every month uh, for, I don't know, I get a one hundredth of a cent or something every time someone watches a, a video, but times 8 million, even a hundredth of a cent makes is something, I don't know what they pay me, but it's, it's, uh, it's nice to get a check from them. And the only reason I get a check from them is because you're watching the videos. Everybody says, oh, when are you going to index them? I, someday, I hope. And when are you going to add more? And, and the, the, one of my most recent ones was from Mike, from Rusty, uh, Rusty Moose Garage. Because Kurt, Mike and Kurt and Forrest all work for me at University Motors. And now they all work for Forrest at Rusty Moose. And Kurt had forgotten how to wind up a, a uh, long extension cord so that it doesn't tangle. I'm, I'm pretty handy with that. So I thought, well, I'll make a YouTube video about that, but I haven't yet. So I, there's lots of videos to make, not only how to wind up an extension cord, but MG ones too. So thanks very much again for the, for the donations that you've um, provided. I appreciate them very, very much. So tonight I just wanna talk just briefly because I, I did get uh, an inquiry from uh, a fella in La the Los Angeles area about how to insulate the cockpit of his MG from, uh, from the heat. And remember that there are three considerations, convection, conduction, and radiation. And convection is by far the most important. If you have a pinhole, I mean, a pinhole in, in, your, in your firewall through which some line, some bit of electrical wiring, something or other goes, and air can come through that hole. It doesn't matter if you got R5000 on the inside of the car, you're gonna get a lot of hot air inside the car. So the first thing you do is get rid of all the leaks, the convection. So you can, you can make that more interesting by covering up all the ones you can, then hanging a bright light in the engine bay and then putting the tonneau cover over and getting underneath and looking up, up underneath the dash and wherever you see light, there's a hole. You can cover the hole with duct tape, you can use dum-dum, you can use grommets, all kinds of stuff you can use, but get rid of those first. Secondly, you wanna, you wanna use some reflective stuff, but really the reflective stuff for the radiation ought to be on the underside of the car to radiate the heat away. I'm not sure how much good it does inside the car. But the next, the next big one is conduction. So there are lots and lots of matting that you can buy, some of it's fabric, some of it's rubber-like stuff that you can put down against the floor. Most of the heat comes through the tunnel uh, on, the, on the MGB, well, and, and on the MGA. Geez, at one of the NAMGAR events, a guy brought his shoe, they were giving out the bad luck award or something, and this guy brought his shoe, it was a, a plastic shoe, and the whole right side of his shoe had melted and just, just was nasty, and they all held it, held it up at the, at the banquet, and everybody cheered and applauded, but that's because this tunnel was so, so hot, so the, the deal is that's where the heat comes from, so it's the tunnel that you want to cover the most. In the, in the tow board. On an MGA, you've got wooden floorboards. I don't know what the R value is on that, but it certainly is very high. On the MGB, it's just metal and the metal conducts very easily. So you wanna get something down on the floor that, that keeps that heat from coming in, especially around the tunnel. 
So that's it, convection, conduction, and radiation. Radiation is the silver foil that you see on top of, of different types of insulation. But again, once it gets inside the car, once the heat's come through the floor, there's not a lot that's going to radiate um, towards you. So, and Dean Hickenlooper says, unable to log into your Zoom meeting, and I don't know why. Um, Dean's from the uh, Chicago area. I don't know, we'll, so we'll wait and see. Maybe he'll persist and find out a way to do it. So that's, that's my introduction for tonight. It's just about conduction, convection, and radiation. And I wanna start over here on the chat side and see what's going on. So we've got a 65 midget here, which is different than, than uh, usually we're talking about in MGBs and stuff like that. So now I've got, um, I got two people can't get on and I just can't tell you why. I don't know Fred and Dean Hickenlooper. It's too bad. Anyway, we've got 133 people who were able to negotiate it. Um, after rebuilding my 65 midget, restoring the body suspension, pretty much everything else, um, uh, I've launched the car only to have her thumping in second gear. I figured that the it was the diff and went ahead and changed that, uh, changed out the thrust washers, but it still thumped. Another MG enthusiast member suggested removing the drive shaft to try to localize the problem as a method of troubleshooting. This was a great idea, which I'd thought of before. Um, this is a long question here. I uh, wish I'd thought of before rebuilding the diff. With the, with the drive shaft removed, the gearbox shifted smoothly but continued to thump or knock in second gear. Is this likely a synchro ring problem? And is replacing the synchro rings particularly tricky? And um, if you've already built an engine, can you do a gearbox? That's what he's asking. And he's asking for suggestions. So I think what the problem is here, if you get a thumping, a real, a, 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 just a, a jerky thump, in second gear is because one of the helical gears is missing, or is partly missing on either the speed gear on the main shaft or the complementary gear on the lay gear. And only by removing the engine and gearbox can you get to this. I don't think you can get the side cover off on a midget gearbox with it in place. I think it's too tight in there. And anything that you'd have to do to it you're going to have to take the gearbox apart. So there's no way to approach this without taking the engine and gearbox out of the vehicle. This is very frustrating. I had a fella call me from Minot, North Dakota, and he'd had his MGB all synchro gearbox, and they're virtually all the same, 68 through 80. Rebuild at a local transmission shop. He didn't feel comfortable doing it himself. And he put it back in the car, and it would shift into reverse, second, third, and fourth, like a dream. First, wouldn't get there. Unmute. Your lever would stop. There's gonna be so many people in this, I didn't wanna get in and talk. So I'm gonna mute everybody again here, not because I don't like you, but just to get rid of the background noise. Um, so he couldn't get it in, it, so he ends up taking the engine and gearbox out, takes the side cover off, and I FaceTimed with him. It was pretty handy. His wife held the, held the, the uh, iPhone and pointed it at what I wanted. And he did what I wanted him to do. And we found out that because there was a missing lock washer, a bolt was too long. And that bolt dragged against the, the gear case when you went to push it into first gear. How bizarre. I've never seen that before. But I have seen thumping and crunching second gears and my guess is that it's one of the helical gears on the speed gear or the leg gear and I'll bet that the engine and gearbox have to come out. If it were to happen in other gears, all gears, then it might be something else but since it's localized just to second gear, I'm still campaigning to take the engine and gearbox out. Take the bonnet off first, it's just easier. You know, but it's just, oh my gosh, taking the engine and gearbox out of a midget. A midget is half the size. It costs half as much to purchase, but they always seem to cost twice as much to repair. Is it like an MGA or an MGB? Go figure. 
Well, that's that's my that's my comment about that. And and uh, who? Uh, this is from Clay Wiseman. So I didn't even ask Clay to unmute himself and and talk to us because I forgot that's what I was supposed to do. But Clay, you're here. You can unmute yourself if you're here. Okay. Hi, John. Yeah. Okay. So this this thing this thing it's it's uh it's so offensive that it's like creepy to drive it in second gear. It is. It's um it's not sustainable. So I did pull the engine and the gearbox, and I'm I was wondering if I can or do the repair myself or if I should send it off to somebody who specializes in that. Um, everyone is so, <laughs> everyone is busy now. Everyone. So I talked to one, another MG shop owner the other day, and he said his his restoration list has grown to twenty. And people, he says he gets a call or two a week. He said I can't get these done in in, in my lifetime. You know, so everyone's really busy. So you you can do it yourself. If you can rebuild an engine, you okay. can. Oh, it's all your box. And give me a call. Now later. it's oh, okay. Robert, your uh, your your uh, Robert with a beard. If you can mute yourself, that'd be real handy, and then I can stay on with Clay. So anyway, I to say John, if I can rebuild a gearbox, that man can for sure. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. So if you can do an engine, you know it's just when you take this when you take the side cover off and you look in there and you see all those teeth, it's like oh my god. But really, it's it's. Uh, I don't want to say you can't get anything wrong because I just talked about the guy in Minot, North Dakota, who who had the he didn't do it, but somebody else had done it. You can get stuff wrong. I used to have these gearbox seminars at the shop, or rebuild seminars, where you'd come for two days and rebuild your own gearbox. One time, a guy got out of the shop and he put his reverse gear in the gearbox backwards, all synchro MGE gearbox. I just didn't see it. We shift through it. We shift through it before you know before you take it away. He got it into his car, I think, only to discover he couldn't get it into reverse. Real embarrassing. Um, but generally speaking, gearboxes are pretty straightforward. And I'm sure when you take that apart, um, you'll find what the problems are. Um, and I'm I'm a, I'm just I always campaign for Paul Deershaw at Sports Car Craftsman in Arvada, Colorado, for used parts. Chances are you're not going to find any new parts, but there's a lot more midgets, and that gearbox was used in a lot more vehicles in England. So there are a lot more a lot more of those midget parts available in in England, and it may be that someone there can help you out once you get the thing apart. Talk to me later, call me tomorrow or something, I'll talk to you. Um, I may have some instructions about it or some hints. The workshop manual is always a, a, a good place to start. Uh, okay, thank you so much, John. Where, where are you calling from, Clay? Uh, calling from Santa Cruz in California. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, yeah. Redwood's behind me. Oh, very cool. Mm. Thank you All again. Right. I'm gonna mute everybody again. Mm -hmm. And my phone keeps dinging. That uh, Fred got, hey, Fred got on, good. But Dean Hickenlooper, I didn't get another note from him. Um, so we're coming down. Our next question is from, from, from Crystal. Hey, Crystal, you're in Texas. Welcome. It's always a pleasure to have, have always pl a pleasure to have Texas on board here. Jason Benham has asked, any thoughts on differing brake and clutch pedal heights on my 74 midget. I replaced the clutch and brake master cylinders, slave cylinder. It's a new car to me, so I'm not sure what it was like previously. The position of the brake and clutch master cylinder, the position of the pedals should be the same. Now, sometimes the cheap trick to making the clutch work is to heat the pedal up red hot and move and bend it up so it sits sits a little higher than than the brake pedal that so you can get enough movement out of it but some of the new master cylinders i hear have got varying lengths of push rods so there's a push rod for the master cylinder brake master cylinder that looks exactly like an mgb but the mgb push rod is shorter go figure um, than a, a midget, but if it's got a B1 in there, it's going to lift the pedal height a lot. 
and um, if, if it even works. And the clutch push rod length might not be original. It has nothing to do with the slave or anything else. It only has to do with the length of the push rods coming out of the front of the master cylinder, unless someone has already heated up and bent that pedal. Now, if it works, you get used to it, big deal, you know, it'll, it'll be all right. Um, uh, we, had a, we had a customer one time, a nurse, she was extremely short and, and we had, um, we welded pedals on top of the existing pedals to bring the pedals up another inch and a half so that she could drive the car. Of course, all of us, when we got into it, it was a, a real barter to move it around inside the shop. But well, we, we, have, we have seen those with, with different pedal heights. So it should be the same. It's natural to have them the same. Feels better to have them the same, but they don't have to be the same. Anyway. And I didn't ask you to unmute. Jason. Hey, can I say you? something? Yeah. <laughs> oh, when? Hey, John. Hey. <laughs> you know, in our shop, we have to heat up a lot of those pedals. And we use an inductive heater, not a, not a flame wrench, so that we don't have to have a fire extinguisher standing by. And um, I just find that in 15 minutes, we can bend that pedal, make it level to the brake, um, as opposed to two hours of screwing around with different length push rods and taking the master sonar out two and three times. It's just really quick and easy to get that pedal up by, by bending it, you gotta be careful. Sometimes it has to be moved so far that the, the angle of the foot pad is really weird. And now you gotta bend that too. But getting them those pedals both the same height has cured many a midget clutch problem for us. Thank you. So Glenn own, owns and runs, he and his wife, excuse me, um, own and run Glenn's MG service in Tampa, Florida. And Glenn was, what's that? St. Petersburg. <laughs> well, all right. Okay. St. <laughs> Petersburg. Okay. So um, anyway, so Glenn's been in the in the MG trade and works on MGs every single day. So I don't know about Sundays, probably. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So hey, thanks, thanks for being here. Yeah. But did Jason, Jason, did you unmute yourself? I did, John. Yes. Oh, okay. All right. So you've got, you, there's a whole lot of information you just got here. So. Yes. Um, yeah. So it seems like the, um, so the push rod for the brake master, I swapped over from the old brake master mm -hmm. or the TWR Lucas one that I put in and the other, the, the, um, the clutch master is a Lockheed unit that I put in. And of course that has the, the push rod that is, fixed to the unit. So that's not, you know, you can't change that out or anything. Um, so I don't, it's, it shouldn't be an MGB push rod in the brake master. That would, that would, if it even fit, that yeah. would lift the brake pedal above the clutch pedal. So yeah, right now my brake pedal is about an inch higher than the clutch. Lower. I'm sorry, is, is what? The brake pedal is higher than the clutch by about an inch. Does the clutch work? It, it, it seems like it grabs about two inches from the floor, two and a half inches from the oh, floor. That's great. I mean, it works. Everything works fine. It just seems a little odd to me, but it's, it's a new car to me. Um, you know, I never had an MG before. This is my first one. And, you know, I'm just not really sure what's normal and what's not. Where, where are you calling from? Um, in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Okay. Well, we, we used to heat those pedals up with a with a blue tip, <laughs> with a with an oxyacetylene torch, get them red hot. Glenn's got the inductive heater. Yeah. That's the that's the expensive man's uh, tool that does the same thing without any any collateral damage. Um, so you can always have someone do that for you. Yeah. And you can get give me a call later on tomorrow next day or something or other, and you can get there's a. There's a website you can go on. It's the BMTA, British Motor Trade Association's website, which is um, Britcar, B-R-I-T-C-A-R, Britcar.org. And you can look around and see who might be around your area who does MG work. 
And there's also another site, Barney Gaylord's site, mgaguru.com, G-U-R-U, mgaguru.com. And Barney's got about a thousand shops in the United States that at one time worked on MGs. A lot of them are lying through, they're closed, they're gone, they don't work on MGs anymore. They're, they're there to show you the attrition. But there's a lot of a lot of shops on there. So between those two sites, you ought to be able to find somebody. Okay. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. Hey, you're very welcome. All right, I'm gonna mute everybody again. Um, not because I don't like you, but because we won't go on the background noise. And here we got Judd. Uh, Judd, it, you can unmute yourself. Judd asks, is anybody driving these days? Well, of course, what he means is driving our cars, not just driving. Several of, uh, of us from local Little British uh, car clubs are going on our annual polar bear run on Saturday. Many of us get out two or three times a month. Driving is what it's all about. Judd, where are you from? Unmute yourself. <laughs> Not North Dakota, South Carolina. <laughs> oh, well, come on. <laughs> <Not there. laughs> well, it's not as good as Santa Cruz, California, or, or St. Petersburg, Florida. Go Bucks. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I don't know, but it, it's funny because I, I look at the forums a lot and people talk about the driving season. Uh, September to June is our driving season because June, July, and August are just too darn hot. And uh, But anyway, we, we have a good time and it's good. What I really am getting to is cars don't do well if you let them sit in the shop. You've got to get them out. If there's a day that's not raining and the sun's shining, put on 16 pair of long underwear and drive it for 20 miles. And ignore my, in, my information about keeping the heat out of the cockpit. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> True. Yeah. Yeah. Just a comment. It's so nice. Thanks it's, for all you do, though. Oh, that's very kind. Thank you. Um, it is nice. It's nice. There's, there's something about something about those uh, those cold weather runs, um, whether they're in October or January. Or, although up here, I mean, this is this. I was only 30 here today, so it's not that cold here. But if you get out and start traveling at any speed, um, it'll it'll freeze the <laughs> it'll freeze the skin off your face. So um, I I had a guy pick up a MG I don't maybe in September something like that and he's going to drive it on the expressway back home. I said you know you're going to get he was he was dressed pretty comfortably pretty lightly and I said you're going to get really cold and I I gave him a pair of glo gloves at least a pair of gloves just cheap old cotton gloves, but anything, anything's better. It gets pretty chilly up, up here. But John, thanks, because that's, yeah. you're right. What, what, one last comment uh, on the gloves, because uh, I can't stand to have my hands cold. So I went down to the Harley store and got a pair of electrically heated gloves and wired in the little extension cord. And let me tell you, they, they make all the difference in the world to have those. If I can keep my fingers warm and my ears warm, I can go. There'll be lots of comments about Lucas Electrics and electric gloves. I know we'll have something following this. So, so well, anyway, hey, thanks very, very much, Judd. That's very kind. All right, our next guy up here is, um, I'm mute everybody here for a minute, Kurt Johnson. So we've got, um, Kurt says, some of us in PA, are planning to go to MG 2021 in Atlantic City. We were wondering if they have let you know what times we'll be speaking. Nothing's been posted yet. Well, my gut is that we're still gonna be in the midst of COVID, but who knows? I don't know when I, I agreed to do some inside and some outside events there, but I don't know what days yet, quite frankly. Maybe they told me Maybe I've got a secret back door into the, into the um, agenda and, and I could re respond and tell you exactly when I was gonna be there, but I haven't paid attention because it's so far in the future, you know, both COVID wise and, and, and date wise. So uh, Kurt, do you wanna unmute yourself? Oh, yeah, I'm, un I'm unmuted. I'm here, John. 
Yeah, yeah that's that's the guy, uh, you know, Daryl and John moved uh, Valentine here in New York. And uh, they wanted to know, you know, because they're planning on coming over sometime. And they uh, said, according to the website, Tuesday and Wednesday are going to be all this sessions. Well, let me let me find out. I've got um, the guy that, uh, you know, the guy that used to do all the tech coordination for the big meets was Hank Rippert. And if you saw, you know, if, if you saw the saw the note, um, if you saw the note that I posted with my constant contact letter, Hank passed away last year, and his TV is for sale. Um, so I'm dealing with Tom Metcalf now from um, from where Mansfield, Ohio. He's he runs Safety Fast Restorations. And he's the one who's contacted me, but I'll I'll find that out in my next Zoom, which is next week Monday. Right. Um, I will if if I have an answer, I'll I'll try to gotta write that down. I know if I was younger, I'd be able to code it into my phone somehow, but I could use a pencil. So anyway, yeah. Well, thanks thanks for planning to come down. This is the. Um, well, which which one is this? This is the fifth one that, that they've had. We did the one in Indianapolis, and then uh, 2001 was in Minneapolis, equidistantly distant for everyone. And then the next one was in uh, Eastern Tennessee. And the next one was in Louisville. So this will be the fifth one. Yeah. Yeah, because this one's only, it's about a three and a half hour drive on the side roads from us. So Very we're, nice. uh, we're planning John? on having a whole convention of people. It sounds like Tony. Yeah, you forgot Reno. Oh, all right. Yeah, I was at Reno. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. So this is the sixth one. Thanks, Tony. Yep. Well, we in, hope to see you there, John. In Reno, in Reno, they had me on like the third floor. And they, they had this big, huge um, helical parking um, ramp that you had to drive up like two or three flights. Uh, so if the car didn't run well enough to get all the way up there, I, I didn't have to look at it. So I didn't have so many cars that ran real poorly. My takeaway from there was the guy with the Judson supercharger and the thing had jammed up and he dutifully waited in line. I don't know, hours in line and said, is there anything you can do? It's like, I can't rebuild your Judson supercharger here. Um, but so, somehow it, it had locked up in a way that the carburetor still was able to vent through the, through the, through the blower and through the manifold, and it was still able to run. That that was when when was that, Tony? Oh, Tony's walked away from the. When was Reno? Reno was 2011. 2011. Yeah, it was 2011. Yep. Yeah. All right, Kevin. Kevin Edwards. You can unmute yourself here. Uh, maybe you said this before, Kevin says, but are the, mo are the motors the same in a 59 MGA and a 67 Austin Healey Sprite? I'm sure that's what he, uh, he means. Because yeah. the big Healey is six cylinder and the Sprite, they're, no, they're, they're absolutely not. Nothing, I don't know. Glenn, what, what, what works? The, the cylinder heads not... You can switch that those. Question, that question again? Oh, that, what, what's what's the same between an A and a B series engine besides the cylinder head nuts? <laughs> oh, that M MGA 1600s is a, a B series engine, and uh, you never found them in any midgets. Um, uh, oh. You can put an MGB engine in MGA. You know, a lot of people do that. But uh, I mean, you can't put any of those in a in a midget. That's a totally different uh, animal. I think I'll come by one time with a with a um, midget that had a V8 in it. Wanted me to go for a ride. I thought I was taking my in my life in his hands because it it was a real early midget and still had drum drum brakes. Um, geez, that thing went fast. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. But anyway, there's there are two engines. Um, um, these were developed by Austin in about 1948. They came out with the B series engine, but it wasn't the same B series engine that we know in the MGA and MGB. 
it was a little smaller and then they popped the size up a little bit. And then at some point they came out with what they called the A-series engine. They're, they're the same engines. You know, look, I, I, I'm sorry, I gotta, I gotta mute everybody here, which means Kevin, you're gonna have to un unmute yourself again. Um, and um, the, uh, it, it's confusing because there's an MGA and there's an A-series engine, but it, they're those alphabetic, that alphabetic nomenclature has nothing to do with MGs and the engines. There's nothing similar with them at all. So the A-series engine is a smaller engine and they use that in the minis and the um, sprites and midgets, a lot of other vehicles, they use it in the marina. Remember the, the uh, Austin, uh, the, here it was the Austin Marina. We didn't see the 1.3s, but in England, they had a, a, a midget engine driving a full-size family car. It, it, I don't know if it'd do 60, but it, would, it must've taken forever to get going that fast. But why he ask, that, that's an interesting question. That, that Traveler right there has, a, has an A-series engine in it. Yeah, behind Kurt Johnson, yep. Yeah. I just asked, because I have the 67 Austin Healy, that's my next project. It it runs, but it just needs a little help. And I was just looking over parts and they look identical when I look under the hoods from the MG in the background. I don't know why I'm upside down, by the way, guys. But, um, <laughs> um, gone on your, gone on your, on your, on your uh, video, if you go down to the uh, toolbar at the bottom, um, there's a little carrot there and you can get the carrot and you can click that. And, and yeah, I see there. stuff down there. I'll fix it when I'm done talking with you, but um, I think it's a good look. That's okay. <laughs> um, the the early B series engine and all the A series engines are the same in that they don't have what we would think of conventionally as a seal on the back of the crankshaft. Instead, they've got a scroll thread, and as the engine runs, it screws the oil back into the engine when it's working correctly. So whenever you go into a rebuild on, a, on an MTA engine, an early B-series engine with a scroll thread in the back or any A-series Spridget engine, you always get the bottom end of the, and T-type engines too, excuse me, you always get the bottom end of the engine align, A-L-I-G-N, align board to make sure that that rear seal works as well as it can. It's not perfect. But it, if it's if it's line board and and uh, set up correctly, it'll be okay. Glenn's the only person I know of who's been able to put a, a seal on the back of a T-type engine and have it work well. Mm -hmm. So just practically, you know, like in Moss Motor catalogs, you, mm -hmm. you think the numbers are going to be the same on parts like water pumps and things like that? If I look at the Austin Healy number and no, it'll be no, different. No, nothing's going to be the same. And the rule, the overriding rule is even. Even, um, even among the different variations of MGAs and MGBs, the rule is if the part could possibly be the same, it's not. So, <laughs> okay. um, so between the Spridget and the, and the um, MG, MGA, they're, they're very, everything looks kind of the same. It's just mm -hmm. scaled down. Hmm. Okay, all right, thanks. So where, where, where are you calling from, Kevin? Well, you talk about driving season. Ours is like from uh, June to July. I'm in Minnesota, about two hours above mm -hmm. Minneapolis in a place called Brainerd. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my yeah. gosh. Although I talked to this guy in Minot, North Dakota, the other day. And I oh. said, was it 17 there? And he goes, oh, no, dude, it's like double that. So he, it was just, just slightly above freezing. He said it had been a pretty mild well, winter, but yeah, I know I've been, I go up to a Mark Brando's shop uh, almost every year. Yeah, yeah it's, 18, it's 18 degrees here today, so not too bad. Yeah, okay. Yeah, right. I've been to that shop once or twice too, the one in the yeah. cities you're talking about. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. Stage coach or something like that. Yeah, coaches. Quality, coaches? quality coaches. Yep. Quality coaches, yes, okay. Yep. Yeah, yeah, he's a, he's a, um, he's a believer. He bought his first, he bought his first MG when he was in the Peace Corps in Malaysia. So mm. had, it, had it shipped back. So every, oh. everyone, everyone's got a story. Mark's got one too. So yeah. anyway, thanks very much, Kevin. I'm gonna mute everybody again. And uh, I'm gonna go down to the next one. Password is case sensitive. Okay, well, that's helpful. I'll, I thought I just had digits in it, but I don't know. Anyway, Dan McGovern's up next. We got 174 people on right now. That's a that's a pretty big showing. 
Um, thank you very kindly. And, and because my little timer went off, I've got to remind everybody to go to my website and push the PayPal button uh, and help me afford my expenses and help me take away something extra so I can have a, afford to have a beer after this. Um, Dan McGovern, can you unmute yourself? Hi, Johnny. Um, I'm in Slido, Louisiana, just outside New Orleans. Yeah, so Dan's, Dan's got a midget here. A 77 midget 1500 came with a 3236 Weber kit already installed. Uh, finally got the engine running, but the inch and the but the air cleaner hits the underside of the bonnet. Um, uh, Dan says, I know you don't like Weber's, uh, but have you ever heard of this? And is there a way to get it corrected? And I, I don't know. Glenn, what do you know about the, this? Those, those air filters do come in different heights. So you just have to find the one that's that's the right height for your application. That's, um, that's the lowest height that I can find. Well, it, you should be able to find one inch, and that should do the job. If, you, if you've got a two inch on there, that's not going to do it. No, it's the one point seven five. If I could find, if, if that's almost two inches. The one inch, I'd be that would be wonderful. Yeah, um, yeah, they're out there. Um, uh, in fact, most of the ones we use are the one inch, and um, we get our parts from uh, uh, from a wholesaler that's associated with Redline. Uh, Weber's, you'll find Redline out on the internet, and um, uh, Advance Auto Parts uh, is associated with that company. Um, but I'd start with Redline, get that, that website up and see what they got, but I, I think well, you'll I've, find I've already emailed Redline and I haven't gotten a response, but I've never found anything under one and a half. Call, call, uh, call Mike Pierce at Pierce Manifolds in, where, where's he, Riverside? Uh, the greater Los Angeles area. He's the one that makes the manifolds and, and um, he's the, he's, he is the antithesis to Joe Curto. He's the Weber King. So you can also check K&N. Uh, K&N yeah. has all sorts of uh, air filters for everything. And they would, they would have a shorter one than that. Cause we have lots of the midget 1500s with that Weber on and we have no problems. So we just well, have the to frame the rail is slightly bent on that side, but what is the frame rail itself is slightly bent on that side from an accident. Mm -hmm. So it might be that the engine's kind of a slightly crooked in there is, is what I suspect. But, but if anything, that should have made it further back in the, in the hood, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not a common problem. It's not an endemic problem to, to put a Weber on a 1500. So, no. yeah. Uh, but the air filter should be at least horizontal to the ground. Oh, it yeah. is. I mean, yeah. uh, I didn't check it when I took the hood off and when I was doing all the work, but when I put it all back together and saw that it hit, I looked at the hood and there's wear marks from before. So it, it was like that before. There are, is, there, uh, is there a spacer? Is there a spacer yeah. between the carburetor and the manifold? No, just the, okay. just the gasket. Okay. The um, 1500 intakes were a, a dip down intake. They weren't straight out. Yes, and they're very hard to put on because of that. You have a dip down intake now. Yes, and it, it, it leaked the first time and everything else because it's a pain. <laughs> well, anyway, we, we don't we don't have an easy solution for you. Um, there are you can always. This sounds so crude, but can use a two by four and a hammer and adjust <laughs> adjust it. So it's, it's always the judicious use. When I when I first got in into into. Being an MG mechanic, I, I thought I would have a hammer in the shop, absolutely, but it'd be behind a piece of glass with a sign that says use in emergencies only. And I was always gonna use the factory tool to do everything. Well, in the end, you use a hammer every third thing, the third, every third tool you need is, is the hammer again. It's just, it's unbelievable, so. Well, I thought about trying to bend the hood a little bit, but I'm worried about cracking all the paint. I mean, that, that's the car no. behind me there. Yeah. Oh, okay. You know, so. Yeah. Now keep keep looking for that shorter filter. You'll you'll find one. They're, they exist. I sure have been looking for them, but I haven't found it. I wish I could. <laughs> so. Um, I don't know. Call me at the shop tomorrow. <laughs> well, I bought a Glenn's a, MG Service a part so. number and a place to buy it. Okay. Glenn's MG Service, Saint Petersburg. Let me put that down. Oh. That'd be great. <laughs> Okay, so maybe we've got this on. We get a lot of midget calls. This is uh, this is interesting. So I'm gonna mute everybody again, 
And now we're gonna go down to Rob Nichols. So you can unmute yourself, Rob Nichols. Rob's got a 72 MGB GT with HIF carburetors, and they're not drawing any fuel up from the float bowl. So how do you test it? Yeah, uh, I, I rebuilt the HIF carbs, and there's fuel going to it. Like I replaced all the hoses, because I know they deteriorate. So I, I rebuilt it, put the whole kit in it, made sure, because at the bottom of that HIF, it's got like a little, a little L-shaped uh, pickup tube. Yes. And made sure the cover at the bottom matched. So it had that little indentation for the pickup tube, but trying to get them going, like if I, I don't get any fuel pooling at the top, you know, where you normally do on the, on the top where the, mm -hmm. where the needle valve goes in, I'm not getting any fuel pooling there at all. And if I pour or spray fuel right through the carburetors and open the flapper valve up, the, the engine will run. So it's, it's, got, it's fuel starvation of some sort. All right, so how old's the fuel in the car, first of all? About two days old. Okay, all right, all right, that's not it. So, so to test the jets, to see if gasoline is actually in the, in the, in the full bowl, it would appear though it's not, but uh, yeah. remove, re remove the suction chambers and the yeah. springs and the air pistons. Yeah. Pull off the line from each carburetor that runs yeah. from the front carb to the rear carb and over to the charcoal canister. Right. Pull those off. Get a line a foot long, 18 inches long of, of um, like 3 sixteenths vacuum line, some kind of rubber line, and yeah. put that on the brass fitting on the carburetor and yeah. puff into it. Don't blow real hard, just puff. And with a, with a strong puff, you can get a column of gasoline that shoots up out of the jet two feet. So don't have an incandescent test light hanging. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Way. So just puff okay. in there and either you're gonna get gas or not. If you get gas, you've got the problem misdiagnosed somehow. You got water in the gas, you got old, you got bad gas, I don't know. Um, yeah. But if you don't get any gas, then it's like, okay, then what's wrong? Then, unfortunately, that's why I don't like HIFs, especially because <laughs> anything wrong with them, you got to take them off the car again. Um, so it might be that they're too rich. Well, it's not, they can be that it's too rich if you had gasoline, but it is possible if you had both of them apart at the same time, yeah. it is possible to switch floats from one to the other. Um, um, well, it doesn't, doesn't seem like that would be possible, but it is, I, you know. Yeah, I no, I, when I took them apart, yeah, I had them separated out so okay. I didn't mix the parts up. Okay. Well, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of the needle and seat maybe is stuck. I don't know. First of all, find the O's do the cheapest, simplest, stupidest, just stuff first, you know, do all the diagnosis first before you take the, before you take the engine back out of the car, you know, and, and and um, in this case, take those suction chambers pist and air pistons out and puff into there. And if you get a column of gasoline that's, that's, I mean, and they're the same yeah. front and rear, then you know that you've got what, what you've got fluid in the carburetors. You know that. Yeah. So what if what if you don't get fuel out of it? You got to take them off. You can take them off and find out what you did wrong. Okay. I've also got a set of spare SU carbs, but I noticed the choke, uh, the, the way the choke goes on the SU carbs is different from the HIF carbs. Okay. So well, what you got, you've got another set of what HS carburetors. Well, I got, well, the SU, the old SU carbs, because I got a 69 as okay. well. And well, I've I got like, spare I, carbs. I like those carburetors better because everything's external. And you can, yeah. you can you can change you can it's difficult you can change the jet in place um, it's easier to take it off but you can do it in place but those HIFs you just uh, anything you got to do to them you have to take them off off the car so yeah. is is would there be any problems 
with a vacuum or anything like that if I put the SUs on? Well, no, no, you, you can you can make it all, all work. You can talk to, to myself or Joe Curto or Glenn or somebody and we, we can give you instructions on what needles to use. We gotta know what kind of carburetors, whether they're, they got a floating needle or a fixed needle or whether they're supposed to take a PCB valve or something, but it's all possible. Yeah. Um, it's it just switching stuff around, but it'll be easier to make your HIFs work, probably. Otherwise, you got to go back into the in, into those carburetors and and re rework those. And most of the parts that you bought for the HIF aren't going to work in the in the um, no. in the HS carburetors. No, no, I got yeah. The rebuild kit I got for the HIF was out of Moss. Um, so that they're, they're the right parts and all that yep. sort of stuff. But yeah, if worst comes to worst, you know, I'm going to put the SUs on the earlier SUs on the thing. I, uh, I, anyway. under, I understand that completely. They're all SU carburetors and they, there are three different styles, four different styles. There's the real early ones, which are called H type for H is for horizontal. And then, and then they, those, those are real long. The bodies were really long. We used them on, on uh, T-types and MGAs and the Triumphs, early TR3s, TR4s. And then they shortened up the body. And those are called HS carburetors, horizontal short body. Um, and then they came out with the HIF, horizontal integral float. And there's also another one called an HD. Uh, Delta H HD for diaphragm. And those are, those are used on monstrous MGs, the inch and three quarter, two inch ones that are used in um, Healy's and Rolls Royces and Bentley. Oh, yeah. Great, yeah. great big, great, great big applications. But they're all SUs. So. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, okay. By the way, yeah, I'm in I'm in Cloverdale, uh, BC, Canada. Okay. I've, I've, right. I've talked to you before on the phone about the uh, wiring in the uh, rear end. You were putting and, your GT I, together. When I, I, I haven't forgotten that. And when I, <laughs> when I get to that point and I've actually got that stuff hooked up, I'll take lots of pictures for you. So. Okay. I much appreciate it. Thank you very much All for right. your time. Hey, thank you, Rob. So I'm going to mute everybody again. And, and um, now we're going to go down to, to, uh, Chip, Euricchio. So anyway, Chip, you can you can unmute yourself. He says I had my car coated with ceramic coating. It really makes the car pop. I would highly recommend it. He doesn't mean the exhaust pop, and he means electric look. But this is some. Uh, um, ceramic coating. This is uh, Chip. Are you still here? Can you unmute yourself? Can you try? Because I'm interested. I'm, I assume what you mean. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So you're you're talking about the underbonded area. You're talking about the the, the paintwork on the outside of the car. No, it's the paintwork on the outside. It's a service that was available. I'm down here in Houston, Texas, and they did it. It's not cheap. It was about nine hundred fifty dollars. Uh, but boy, does it make the paint look great. It's, so it's really a, remarkable. An exo exotic, exotic wax job or something. It's some, some coating that goes on top of the existing paint. Yeah, and it lasts about 10 years, but uh, it looks a lot better. That car was just refinished uh, and it looked pretty good before. Now it looks spectacular. Ceramic coating and who, who applies this? Where, where do you get this done? Get a it was a detailing shop, shop that does it on the side. We got a place here in Grand Rapids that I'm sure that's the name's duplicated around, but it's called OC Detail. <laughs> they do they do cleanup and stuff like that. Use use car prep mostly, but yeah, yeah. So that's that's nice. So, so what's the temperature in Houston today, Chip? It was nice. It's uh, 60s to 70s in the afternoon. Warmer than Michigan. It is absolutely warmer than Michigan. So anyway, so that's, I think I, maybe, I don't remember if Rich Caldwell, who's on my screen right next to you. Um, I don't remember if, Rich, did you talk to me about getting a car ceramic coated? Yeah, I did. I did. Um, I'm glad I didn't since I had to mess up the paint a little bit. <laughs> 
but there's there, that's another technology. There's another technology, and I think we talked about it that uses a graphene for formulation. I mean, I mean, uh, downstream of Buckminster Fuller's technology, not only uh, not only as a, a lubrication, but as a um, is a surface protectant, and that's going into coatings. And it, it's, I mean, we got a century of new technologies and materials that is just going to blow everything away from the past. It's expensive, oh. though. It's got one thing in common: they're all expensive. Okay. That and, and that gentleman who had his car done, um, that nine hundred dollars probably was less than a pint of material. But that's that, that's that's that the spherical, right? Spherical carbon. There, that's the there, there's, there, there's well, the graphene is is one. His is ceramic, so it's got uh, silica platelets in it, you know, and they line up in, and I mean, give you nearly a scratch-free uh, finish. Oh my gosh! Well, in, but, anyway, there's it's there, there's, only money. <laughs> What what else is it for except to make our our MGs nicer? Oh, they're beautiful though. It, it he's right. It, it, it glistens. I think that's down far on my parts cost list towards the end there. You know. Right. Well, anyway, Rich, thanks, Chip. Thank you very much for for alerting us. Thank and you. And I'm I'm sure this is available someplace other than Houston. So, but uh, it, everyone's everyone's aware now that these two things are available. Right. So, Rich. It all says is Rich talking about your Chrome Bumper 74. You can unmute yourself. What's the best way to get the motor mounts to align on my Chrome Bumper 74? Um, so he's got it um, unbolded and replaced the motor mounts while I had the front suspension removed. I don't have an engine lift. I'm jacking up the motor, but I can't get the second motor mount bolt holes to align. The motor doesn't slide down enough to get the holes aligned. What do I do? So it could be, help me out, maybe Glenn knows, maybe some of the new motor mounts are incrementally taller than the old ones. That would cause a problem. Well, quite often you have to just uh, get out that hammer that we don't know. Ah. Start smacking the things down a little bit. And they'll never line up exactly just by themselves. They need some compression on the rubber to do their job. So, uh, Generally, you can get the one side, a couple bolts started on the one side, and just go to the other side and start smacking on the mount, the metal metal part of the mount until the holes line up. Okay. All right. Yeah. So so I, I was at that point. I'm actually in Florida right now, but I'm a Massachusetts guy. So uh, that's where my car is. You went down there uh, to get down here. COVID, COVID uh, uh, injection to, to beat the uh, Not yet. Okay. No, I'd okay. like to, but I'm not right. old enough to okay. qualify. Right. Okay. Uh, but um, but yeah, I was at the point of hitting it with a hammer. Uh, actually, I got a steel rod that I was going to use to, and then hit the hit the steel rod with the hammer to try to drive it drive it down. But I, yeah. before I resorted to that, I wanted to. Are you talking just a little bit, like a, an eighth of an inch or? A, or Three sixteenths, just a little bit. Yeah, it's yeah. it's not it, much. It, it, it harder. It harder. Yeah. Well, it's and, not. It's, yeah, it's not an easy area to get a hammer down into. You yeah. can't um, hit anything with a hammer that's rubber because it just bounces back. Well, I'm talking so, about the front. Yeah, yeah. Hit the yeah, the, the the top of the motor mount bracket can yeah. Yeah, can get yeah you can hit that. Um, yeah, so my my seventy four is a um, Mirage color. A Mirage oh my color. gosh! She's a rare bird, I believe. Yes, yes, it's it's not as rare as Aqua in seventy three, but it's a really beautiful color. Oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah. So, all right. When I get back in the spring, I'm going to hit it with a hammer. The um, the tools that we have in our toolbox that we we've got they you know they, they look like um, uh, sharpened Phillips screwdrivers but they, they got a hook on the end and you can use those to push down in there and and wedge those holes around and once you get one bolt in then getting the rest yeah. of them, just a a matter yeah. of using Phillips screwdrivers or whatever and and um, levering this stuff in, into place. 
Yeah, yeah. I was trying to get. I used. I I actually got an alignment rod, to thinking that I could get that, but there wasn't enough space. They, all the ones I got were too long to, to yeah. fit into that area. So, uh, so thank and thank you very much, John, for all your years. Of, You're very kind. Well, we got to thank um, Glenn tonight too because he's on helping yeah, out. Yeah. I, I campaigned heavily for him to come on tomorrow night within a, we've got a BMTA thing. And I don't know, are you on tonight accidentally or did you come on tonight because this is what you uh, thought I was talking about? Well, I came out tonight for practice because I don't know how to do this Zoom thing. This is Gail's account. So I guess I got it figured out. Okay, all right. And R Richard, you've got, um, there's a plate that goes on the, only on the left-hand side. You're right. Got... That's, the, that's the one I've, that's the side I'm working on that's, that I can't, that I can't get a line. But yeah, I do have the plate in there oh, and uh, the, and I use the I actually saw it online that putting a zip tie around the uh, or, or to to connect it to the motor mount so that it doesn't get out of place. Yeah. Are, are you at, that, are you that, putting that work? Because some of those cars had shims and sometimes you got to leave them out because they're just for for the original mounts and the original setup. So if you got any shim plates in there, just don't, don't use those. Oh really? Okay. There's always a shim on the left, isn't there? The shim I, I, is on the steering column side. Yeah. 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 Just take just take yeah. those out because that's leave it out. A factory thing to make it that might it perfect. Oh, okay, because that might that might make it easier. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll do both if necessary. I'll take the shim out first. <laughs> thank you both. Hey. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. So I'm gonna mute everybody again, and here we go. And now we're, we're up, we got 166 people on, down from a little bit from what we had before. Um, so now Frank Zakis, it's close, yes. uh, is writing about his 78, 78B in Inca, in Inca B, I see it there. Yep, and he said, what are the signs of a bad catalytic converter? I hear a box of rocks while shifting gears while letting off on the gas pedal. So it could be that there's a problem with the exhaust and so something's loose inside the exhaust. That's true. And it could be that there's a problem with, with, the, with the differential also. Usually, if there's a problem with the exhaust, you can duplicate it without being on the road. If you sit in your driveway and just rev it up the foreground and very slowly let it come back down, if you get a zzz or a crunching or rattling, something's loose in the exhaust or the mounts are loose or something like that. On the other hand, if it only happens on deceleration, I'm just trying to think of what odd for the differential to make a noise unless you're in, more, more than more than um, just a, a single or a, a couple of heavy clicks or something or other. So, but if the converters, but where, where are you calling from, Frank? Gastonia, North Carolina, by Charlotte. Well, you don't need a you don't need a catalytic converter, right? Okay, so if you're if you're ad absolutely adamant that you must have it on the car for whatever reason you want it there, um, you can always take the exhaust loose from the converter and look up in there and you'll be able to see whether it's hollowed out or all those porcelain pieces are loose. If they're loose, then you're taking an awful lot of energy to push the exhaust gases through there. Um, I'm not sure who's got good used ones. Um, or new ones, but more than likely, it's not the converter. More than likely, it would be in the exhaust system. I think that, yeah. I think that's true. What do you think, Glenn? Well, I, I, just, I saw one strange catalytic converter uh, defect many years ago. Inside a catalytic converter is a ceramic honeycomb material, and uh, that will break and shatter into little pieces, and we had a bee that would just lose power once in a while, going on the road, couldn't take gas, and then it would be fine. So we took the catalytic converter off. There was a lot of rattling and stuff going on. And inside that, that ceramic had broken up and a piece of it had turned into a baseball. 
and the baseball would sometimes turn sideways and stick in the pipe on the way out and block off the exhaust. You know, the old banana and the tailpipe routine. And then the ball would come back out and he'd have power again. So that was the weirdest thing I've seen a catalytic converter do. Just <laughs> broke I can't think of I can't think of noise. Unless unless it broke up, unless the converter broke up and little bits of it um, you know, jumped down the down the tailpipe and got caught caught in the in the muffler. Just hit the just hit the exhaust system and you'll hear just smack it and smack the resonator. You'll hear if there's anything in there rattling around. You'll hear it. Okay. It'll, it'll jingle at you. Okay, I'll do that. That's a nice looking car there, Frank. How, how long have you owned it? Well, I've owned it since uh, 2015. It was a basket case. It was uh, sitting in a self-storage unit with a 74 and a half GT. And both cars are in absolutely terrible condition. A lady had a, actually had them in there for 15 years, paying all that rent and didn't do anything with them. So I, apparently a friend of hers convinced her to get rid of them. And so me and uh, another guy from the Metrolina MG Car Club went over to take a look at them. And we offered salvage value for the cars and, we, and the cranks would turn. So we knew the engines weren't uh, seized up. So he took one, I took the other, and then uh, I just started working on it mechanically first, little bit by little bit, and then uh, started working on the body, uh, cut out a lot of metal, replaced a lot of the metal on the, on the uh, fenders and uh, other parts of the car. Did all that and then uh, had, it, uh, had it painted. So it runs really well. I love the way it runs. Only thing I'm a little bit concerned about, it's weird, I'm sure you know about it, that gooseneck bimetal piece that's hooked up to the air cleaner that goes to the SU carb, or not the, the Zenith Stromberg carb. And uh, that's a weird looking thing, but uh, it works. I mean, Does it rattle? It, it, it rattles when you first start the car up because uh, everything's cold. If you, if you take that off, you can take duct tape Wow, we're back to hammers and duct tape. Yeah. Take, take some little sections of duct tape and, and get that real clean in there. First with some carb cleaner and let it, you know, let all the crap get off it. And then you can put the duct tape in there and that'll that'll um, soften it so it, it doesn't go ding, 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 ding. Um, right. it, it'll still funk, but it, it, won't, it won't sound like a cheap Chinese bell. Yeah, yeah, I'll try that. Okay. But, uh, well, thank you very much. Hey, thank you. Thanks. Thanks for logging in. So I'm going to hit mute all again and mute everybody just because I do that each time. And now we're going on to Dave Dens Densmore, who's got something to say about about uh, uh, heat in the cockpit. And Dave, you can un unmute yourself. He said he's used a dynamat on the driver's side on the 74 BGT before he started putting it down. Um, the seat or the, um, I started it before putting the seat or carpet okay. down without thinking. I set my arm down where there was no dynamat and I jumped because it was so hot. Where the dynamat was, it was warm, but I could easily set my hand on it. So the point is that the dynamat, which is one of the, one of the proprietary brands for, uh, um, this insulation uh, works really well. I think it doesn't. Um, did you did you order the kit, Dave? I uh, I live 20 minutes from a summit, so I bought some at a summit, um, put it on the floor. It, it cost me sixty dollars to do about two square foot, maybe. So I realized that wasn't going to work so well. So I uh, I did that on the on the uh, driver side. Um, and then for the rest of it, I use like that insulation, foil insulation, like kind of like you were talking about, I think the bubbles in it, which was pretty cheap. It worked for, good for the rest of the car. I also used some uh, muffler shielding I had got from Summit that was uh, 
it wasn't a metal plate. It was like a, a insulated blanket, small one that went over the exhaust pipes and it made a tremendous difference in the car, tremendous. Yeah, we went down to Dillard and uh, it was 90 some degrees one day. And I mean, it wasn't like it was cold in the car, but it, at least it wasn't up in 115, 120. It stayed really close to what the temperature was, you know. So worked real well, highly recommend it. Very nice. Well, I know that I know that those who have uh, headers on their car instead of a factory exhaust manifold are almost always needing to wrap those with it's not asbestos, but it's some sort of asbestos look-alike um, stuff. My comments, of course, on headers are all headers are noisy, all headers are hot. All headers leak, all headers are headaches. I'm a real believer in the factory manifold, which you can make work with anything, any, any other intake manifold. Um, it's just the best, that double Y is just the best exhaust that is going. You don't lose any performance um, or gain any performance with one over the other. It's just the factory one is so nice and fits anyway. Uh, speaking of that, before you get too far, then yeah, I had a header on the car when I first uh, when I first redid it, and uh, eventually the and I had wrapped it and stuff. It looked really sharp. It was nice looking. And well, anyway, eventually it ru rusted out, and so I didn't know what to do because I didn't want to spend that much money on a header. And I went ahead and went back to a factory manifold. The one thing I did find, I had a Pico header, by the way. I should tell you, a Pico header, a Pico exhaust. Just taking and, and putting the stock manifold back on, I dropped my um, RPM uh, uh, power band, probably by five or 600 RPM. It actually made the car easier to drive because it was, you know, for street driving, so. Well, that's, in, that's interesting. That's it. theoretically, it shouldn't make any difference at all, but you know, it, it's always interesting to, reports from the field, you know, what actually does make a difference and, and, and what doesn't. Well, people that were paid far more than Glenn or myself designed these things all to work as a unit. And, uh, and, and by pulling stuff off and pulling off the factory air cleaners and putting on little tiny thin chrome air cleaners that sure look cool, but they, they can't breathe. <laughs> they can't breathe at all. Um, stuff like that, you know, and then in, in, anyway, anyway, the factory stuff is always good stuff and it fits um, as long as it's really factory stuff. So where, where are you from again, Dave? Oh, I'm from Wadsworth, Ohio, which is uh, kind of southwest of Akron. Okay. All right. Yeah. Great. Well, hey, thanks very much for, for uh, coming in yeah. to, the, to the meeting. So I'm going to mute everybody again. Just for a minute here, and we're coming down to uh, Robert. I, I haven't got the whole. I've got the whole name here. When I signed down, I got a notice. There's a difference between what was printed on the notice and what was embedded. So I chose the embedded and got on with no difficulty. Uh, you know, there, we're we're still all learning about Zoom. Nobody heard of Zoom. Well, nobody heard of Zoom until like last April and then all of a sudden, and WebEx, which is the, the, I always heard about WebEx, you don't hear about them now. I, I don't know, Zoom's taken off, but it's, it's not flawless. I do the best I can here. So uh, Dan Rice, maybe to everybody, he's got a 79 Spitfire. So Dan, you can, you can unmute yourself and we can talk about your 79 Spitfire with a vacuum retard distributor when setting timing at 32 degrees advance with a vacuum disconnected, do you reattach the vacuum when you have the timing set? I would say no, just, just leave it disconnected. Um, what do you say, Glenn? Uh, you'll see a lot of the Triumphs that had these retard the timing at idle systems. And it was an emissions control system. If the, if the vacuum retard is still good, then all you have to do is set the timing to four after it at idle with the vacuum on. But the key thing is, is the vacuum retard still good? Rarely are they. Um, this one is working. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the factory setting is two after. 
Um, if you take the hose off, um, or if the vacuum retard is bad, you know, about five to seven before does the job just fine. Um, uh, on the TR6s, uh, there's a, actually a, a new vacuum advance now for those cars. It does away with all that and um, uh, you know, wakes those cars up pretty good. Two after is, or four after, two after is, a, is an emission setting. Don't be afraid to bump it up some. Okay. Um, don't be afraid to, if you've got a bad vacuum retard on your Triumph, just to ignore it and leave the hose off and bump the timing up to five to 74 and off you go. Okay. All right, thanks. So uh, again, the, the, the cars, when they ran the best, they ran the best rather in 1967. Beginning in 1968, the cars didn't run the best. They, they, they polluted correctly. And there, there's almost, in the range of MGBs, there's almost a different distributor every year from 1968 through 1980. Same engine, but they just keep fiddling around with it so that they could meet the emission standards. So if you want to make your car run the best, an MGB, for instance, you use a 40897, which is the old 25D distributor, or a 41427, which is which is a 45D with the same advance curve. And you have to port that through the carburetor. So if you don't have a port on the carburetor to hook the vacuum advance to, you can send your your can you can send your rear carburetor to Rob Medinsky at British Vacuum Unit in New Hampshire. He's got a little jig and he'll drill a hole through the body and get it ported. This is for the HIF carburetors, um, so that you can you can use that earlier distributor correctly. But Bob does all our distributor rebuilding and uh, he does wonderful work and it'll really wake up your engine what he does. So that's that's some that's some information Dan you can send your distributor off to Rob Mendinsky too. British it's an odd business name. Yeah. British Vacuum Unit. He's on the he's on the uh, um, he's on the web. You you can find him. Okay. All right. Thank you. Hey, thank you. I'm gonna mute everybody again, and we're gonna come back to Alan uh, Tavis. Is there an easy way to connect tubing to the window washer on the driver's side of an MGB? That's no. the question. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, you know, I put a new washer pump motor on and I, I pushed the, the um, lever and it worked really well, except for the water was pouring onto the floor rather than going up there because that tube was gone. And so, I don't know, I'd love to be able to replace it, but I, I need a 10-year-old uh, who knows about MGBs. Well, my experience on doing that kind of stuff is that if you, if you have to, to figure out where something is, you stuff yourself down underneath the steering wheel with a light and just look up. You can't work. You can't work um, upside down and, and trying to push your hands into there. It, most of us don't fit there like that anymore. But if you get a view of what you're doing or take a mirror, and put a light against the mirror that shines up inside and illuminates. You can sort of see what you're trying to do. And then you just do it blind. You get there, yeah. and push the seat. I have, tried, I have tried the mirrors with the light. I've tried getting under there. It, the difficulty is getting out after I get under. And, <laughs> um, you know, and I really can't see anything up on the top there. And every time I look at it, like if I go to MG Experience and, uh, and ask the question, or see what other people have written. They say, "Don't even try it." You know, you, you just you have to get somebody very, very small um, and be able to get underneath there and be able to try to figure it out. But I was thinking whether you could pull it up from the top, and wh whether you could actually just jam it out of the out of the hole in the on the the front of the car, and then stick a tube down from there. But I don't know. I think there's probably bolts on the bottom there, nuts on the bottom that hold it in place. So I can't really pull it out. Yeah, there's a seven sixteenths nut on the bottom side of the of the um, washer. 
because you've got a what 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 year's your car? Seventy four. Yeah, so that you've got a you still got a chrome chrome squirter, so that's got a yeah that's got a nut on the underside of it. So right. getting well, the nut off is more complicated than than getting that that hose back on. I don't I have no I. Well, I've got to tell you, I thank you very much because you had told me to call Glenn and I spoke to Glenn a few months ago. And of course, it's always a pleasure talking to you. So thank you very much for putting these on and thanks Glenn again for being a part of this. Uh, you know, so it's, um, it's a good thing. So I appreciate that. Thank you for well, your time. Wish we could help you out more than, than uh, in, you know, involving child labor. <laughs> well, I understand, but you know the fortunate thing is that I'm I'm in South Florida, so I don't have that low temperature to have to worry about. I'm in the same temperature range as Glenn is, um, and so and and when you talked about COVID, um, fortunately I had my vaccine today, so that's uh, that's hey. my first start on on not worrying about COVID. So hope everybody else is in the same boat. Hey, great, good for you. So thanks again. Hey, you're very welcome. Now we're going to go over to Anthony, uh, who um, I don't know what year and model you've got. So Anthony, you're going to have to come on and tell us, can the shift lever damper be installed when the engine uh, and gearbox is installed? So the gear lever, the shift lever damper, what, what year and model are we dealing with here, Anthony? We're listening, waiting for Anthony. Um, to come off, can the shift lever damper be installed when the gearbox and engine is installed? So I don't know without knowing what year and model we're talking about, but on all the cars, you can install the gear lever after the engine and gearbox are in place on all the cars. T-type, MGA, that, that it all comes off either with a remote control or, or it comes out by, by itself. So since um, Anthony hasn't tuned in, we're gonna go on to our next one, Walker Eaton. Uh, my 54 TF has no reverse. Any ideas? Well, speaking of the remote control housing and how easy it is to come off, um, Walker, are you here? Can you unmute yourself? Maybe Walker. Yeah, yeah. Here we go. Okay, so so where are you calling from? Wilbraham, Massachusetts. We're about 80 miles east of Boston. Okay, so did the TF have great reverse and one day it just quit working or what? Well, I just finished the restoration. My grandfather started in the 90s and he had the engine rebuilt, transmission was rebuilt, went to go back to the car to the garage and nothing. So can you actually get the gear lever to fall into reverse, do you think? No, it won't even go over. Like it, it'll go into fourth, fine. But like if you go to push it over into reverse, nothing. Okay, now there is, there is a lockout. So pushing it sometimes doesn't do it. You really have to slap it. Okay. Um, it, there's, it's to prevent you from accidentally engaging reverse instead of fourth. So you really, have, if, if you just push, uh, sometimes it's really difficult to overcome the, the spring, uh, the spring and ball that, that's in place. But if you whack it with your hand and you can't, I mean, it's all metal. You're not, you know, if you get a sledgehammer and start hitting that, maybe you can do, do some damage. I'm not suggesting that, but just with your hand, you won't do any damage. So be more aggressive, really slap it over to your, to your right and then pull it back. I'm assuming this is a left-hand drive car. So, yep. All right. Thank you. So just try try that. If that doesn't do it, oh my gosh, then the then the carpet, the center carpeting has to come out. The rubber, the rubber piece that goes the um, there's a rubber piece in there to for air and and noise that comes out. And then the remote control comes off. Then you got to stuff your head down in there. But before you even get there, um, call somebody, call Glenn, call, call myself, one of us, and we can, we can help you out, figure out what, what to do next. Um, this is probably pretty solvable. All right. Sounds good. Will do. Okay. Hey, how, how old are you? 
I am 22. And you've been working on this TF for how long? Six and a half years, finishing that restoration. Glenn's looking for, for mechanics, call him. Okay. <laughs> okay, all right. All right, hey, thanks a lot, Walker. Okay, Anytime. Then we, got, then we got to Glenn Baxter, who has weighed in here. He says, I'm always surprised that I never see MGs on the road. I live in Southern Cali California. Think of how many thousands of these were sold. Where are they? They're in everyone's garages, that's why. Um, I took a trip to England in the year 2000 with my late wife, four kids, and we, um, we drove all around England for two weeks. I saw one TR6 and one big, no, an MGC. I saw an MGC and a TR6, that was it. That was it, that was the only two. I mean, England, I mean, wouldn't they have them too? So you have to go to the meets. You just have to go to, to the meets to, to see them then hang, hang around. The, Glenn, did you weigh in here? Are you, are you uh, unmuted? Can you come in? Uh, I'm, I'm here. Oh, all right. <laughs> no, Glenn, I mean, Glenn Baxter, who asked the question. Well, oh. all right. We're not there, so, so I don't know. Everybody's supposed to drive their cars. That's what Judd told us. I think he, he was the first one up, up or second one up tonight. Um, it's like, drive your cars. Drive your, get out and drive them. So, all right, from Chip. Um, does anyone adjust their water jacket chokes depending on the season? If it works for you, sure. Um, nominally, it's self-adjusting. You shouldn't have to adjust it. You always, on a, on a water-choked, Stromberg carburetor, they always start off full choke, doesn't matter whether it's hot or whether it's cold, always starts, starts on full choke, and the instant then that you relax the key and it, and it continues to run, uh, and you let the throttle back down, um, the bimetal strip in there has decided where to position the cam, which decides your, your fast idle. But I, I tell people sometimes if it's not starting, if it's not starting, then turn your water jacket clockwise as seen from the front of the car incrementally and keep track of, of how far you've moved it. Uh, and, and you're usually limited by the bottom hose and you really can't rotate it much more than about a quarter of an inch without that bottom hose starting to, to um, collapse. So anyway, but that that was Chip, but Chip didn't weigh in here. So oh, well, here you are, Chip. You're back. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, all right. So when it's cold down in here in Houston, I think it gets too much choke and it backfires a little bit. So I have to. They're adjustable. You can dial it back. Do you still have the air pump on your car? Uh, yes, I do. Is that because you want it there, or you just haven't taken it off yet? It just looks original. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Um, if you leave it on, there's more, there, there, there are more considerations. I'm, I know how to make this stuff work better with a, with the, um, with a pump gone and by a backfire, do you mean like a rifle shot down the tailpipe or do you mean a, um, no, when you take your foot off the gas, sometimes you, you hear a little popping in the tailpipe pop, 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 and then okay. once it warms up, that's gone. Okay. It only happens when it's cold out. Yeah. So you can suffer it. That's one. Or you could rotate that slightly anti-clockwise. See if it makes a difference. Yeah, I think that's what I need to do. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to mute everybody again. I got to make my, my standard pitch to please go and visit my website. And that hasn't changed in five years. I'm talking to my daughter about updating it and making it nice. Glenn's is probably more up to date than mine. Mine looks like I'm still in business. I'm not. So, um, Rob Tedro. Rob Tedro is weighed in here with a 59 MGA, three sequel gearbox is not working. Um, so, he rebuilt the gearbox, but it sat full of engine oil for five years. Upon restart, it shifted okay through all the gears. Uh, then, third gear became trouble. Blood to clutch, that didn't take care of it. Um, third got worse, severe grinding. Now it won't go into second. 
only have first and reverse now. It's not the hydraulics. Because if it's hydraulic, the hydraulics are faulty, Rob, then it doesn't go into first and reverse, but it goes in everything else just fine. So something's wrong with the inside of the gearbox. What? I'm not sure. I don't think it's as simple as a, as a uh, synchro ring, a bulk ring. Um, I think you're going to have to get it out and get the side cover off. What do you think, Glenn? Well, the transmissions uh, might look easy on YouTube or in the book, but if you taking one apart that's in pretty good shape and getting it back together again is is not all that hard. But knowing what part is bad or recognizing how much wear is on a particular part is key to successful rebuilding that unit. Um, I, I hate trying to rebuild a unit that I don't know anything about and. It's just that somebody found it in a garage somewhere and it was, it's, it's not on the car. I can't test it. You know, it, those type of scenarios are maddening because you need to know what the thing's doing uh, before you can have a successful repair. And there's lots of mistakes to be made inside those transmissions. Lots of mistakes to be made. As, a, as an ancillary to that, just an extra to that, um, the new synchro rings don't work out of the box and you must lap them with that like valve lapping compound. You must lap them to the cone uh, face on the speed gear before installing them. That's, that's not the steel synchros. Steel synchros work fine, but the brass synchros, absolutely. So anyway, Rob, this thing, this thing just, uh, it, it physically won't change into, into second, third or fourth or, when you're in gear, it, it, or when your engine's running, you can't get it in. When it first when it first started running the car, we we've got less than ten miles on it, and it ran fine. We did have some clutch problems, and we we bled. It's got dot five um, brake fluid, which I don't think is an issue. Everything had been cleaned out. There there isn't any contamination. Every all the lines were new, the slaves new, and it was a rebuilt um, master cylinder. So, but we fought that for a while, trying to get all the bubbles out of that dot five fluid, I think. But we, we, we achieved that. And then it ran for a few miles, just running around the neighborhood, testing other systems, waiting to get the wiring finished on the brakes, that kind of thing. And in that period of time, you're just doing short little runs. Um, the transmission got worse and worse. And I agree with you. I thought maybe the, um, the synchronizer rings weren't manufactured properly for their mating piece and maybe one of them got stuck on three four and now it, now with it caught on three four we can only work in the in the lower range which happens to be first because I can't get the second but it sure made a, a tremendous amount of noise one time we got it I think it it was in neutral we were going down a hill and it was just grinding to beat the band so the decision now is to pull it out of the 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 car and do a uh, analysis of what happened, but at the same time, consider putting in a Japanese five-speed. Any comments on, would that be something for an A that would make the driving experience a lot more uh, enjoyable because of the the, uh, the fifth gear and the and the, the ratios? Yeah, that those yeah. Are, it's wonderful. It's not, I, Mr. I call myself Mr. Original, but I got a 3.9 diff in my, my MGA. So my, my MGA um, is, is the higher gear overall. It is maybe, maybe not the same as having a, a fifth gear, but those Japanese gearboxes are, those, they're, they're just great, wonderful. It, it's four grand. Oh. So that's the downside. But I think we're going that route. And I pulled a, um, a three nine differential pumpkin out of an early B, um, just in case we decide to put that in, what the, I want. in the A. Um, just make, make sure there are three different half shafts in MGAs. There's a, a 10 spline, and then the involute splines are a 25 and a 26. And they used one or the other of those 25, 26 for 10 months in 1960 or something, and then went to, a, went to one that's common with the MGB. Um, but it, it just it depends on what what half shape. So you may have to change the differential and, and pinion gears, but you're going to have to 
just keep that in mind. So okay. we don't have it all, all apart. You can take the gearbox out through the tunnel. That's the plan. There's no, the, the, the seats are the seats are going to be out, and uh, we're going to go through the top. We're going to take the floorboards out. Okay. So Glenn, what do you got to say about the the MGA training out the inside? No. I, I can't imagine how that's done. We did it on a twin cam once at the shop because <laughs> it was uh, it, we thought it'd be heat. It was it was a real problem, but it was easier than than taking the whole twin cam engine out. Well, I would I would agree with that, but the uh, the A motor doesn't come out all that hard. Um, I don't like putting A engine and trannies in while they're bolted together. That's a real pain. But uh, yeah, I had never tried taking A tranny out the middle. I'm not even sure. You'd have to take the floors out and the tunnel. You'd have to take all the floors out, yeah. the cobalt out, the, the tunnel. Boy, that's a lot of work. I'd, yeah. I, I, yeah. But Rob's, we're, going, Rob's we're going for it. it. You know, it's not my car. It's my buddy, Jan. And uh, he took the seats out for winter storage. So we're halfway, at least the, you know, the car hasn't run yet. So it's still, there's no interior in it. So well, next hey, week, John? when we're on, you can tell us what, what you found in the gearbox. Hey, we're John? doing that probably till sometime in March or April. Yes. Someone. This is Rich. I just wanted, I'm the guy who commented earlier, if I can change a gearbox, anybody can. But I did get burned on one of my gearbox uh, restorations. There was a guy at, at Moss, Blaine, I think his name was, who told me I was number 17. I'd got a, a second gear synchro that was machined with its inner diameter too, too large. Um, and it never seated properly. In fact, there's a standoff that should sit against the, the base of that gear that wasn't proper. Right out, of the, right out of the parts bag, it was wrong. And I don't remember what that standoff is, but I mean, if I were to do another one, I'd be paying very close attention to what that dimension was. Because but Rob, does, Rob doesn't have to do any of that because he's going to put a Japanese box in. So. <laughs> well, we are going to tear the old one apart, though, because we're curious. Oh yeah, for sure. And we'll get some pictures. Stay in touch. Let me right. know what, what, what's wrong. Because I just can't imagine why all those gears are buggered up. I mean, one or I mean, we've had. I had two cars, two that would work in first and second and reverse, no problem. Third and fourth, it's as though the clutch was bad. It's as though you had a, a broken half shaft. It, it just nothing happened. We took the gearboxes apart and the nose twice. I've got both of them. The nose on the main shaft broke off. I mean, there's just weird stuff that happens. And then there's in, incorrect assembly and then and then there's faulty parts. So anyway, we'll be interested to find out what, what the scoop is. All right, well, we'll, we'll bring that up uh, late, late spring uh, oh. after we've got this thing down. All right. Where, in, where, where are you going from, Rob? Uh, North Canton, Ohio. Just, just south of uh, Akron. Okay. Whereas I think Chip was uh, in Wadsworth, west of Akron. So, got a, got a buddy nearby. Great, great. All right. Well, thanks, thanks so much for logging in today. So, Mark Miller, I'm replacing the rear hub seals on, on my new to me steel disc wheel 59 MGA. On reassembly, I noticed that the spacer is about seven thousandths proud of the hub face. Can the O-ring and paper seal make up for this difference or do I have the wrong bearings? This is a real specific question. Um, it might be that the, that the hub and, and, and bearing are not assembled as tightly as they could be. It, when you when you put the, the half shaft when you put the half shaft in and tighten up the, the four lug nuts that'll draw the housing up more tightly against uh, against that bearing so you may lose some of that seven thousand so that's a lot that's a lot thicker than a paper gasket but that's why you use uh, the right stuff or ultra black 
on that gasket, a lot of it. Um, so anyway, but that here, let, let me um, come back to Mark Miller. Can you unmute yourself? Are you here, Mark? Yeah. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Along with your buddy. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, getting the hub seals in, that's usually the hardest part. So how, how did, you, did you tighten this thing up and, and use a feeling gauge on it or what? Um, I had a caliper and just ran some calipers on it, just butting it up against them it's the best I could. Okay. I think, I think that the housing will, will move farther towards the outside of the car when you tighten up the lug nuts. I mean, okay. that's a possibility. And you could also, you could, if, if it doesn't, of course, it's just going to spew oil everywhere. Yeah, or, that's the way it was when I found it. Okay. I don't know that those bearings are, we wouldn't think that there'd be that much of a variance in those bearings. Seven thousandths isn't much, but when you're making a machined, you know, ball bearing like those things are back there, uh, you'd think that the, that the measurements would be the same from 1960 to, to today when someone's still making them. Have you run into this, Glenn? Well, I, I run into it exactly what you say. Sometimes putting the hub on dislodges the bearing from its seat. And when you put the four lug nuts on and tighten everything up, it just pulls it back where it belongs. That's normally what, the, what we see. Well, I'll give it a try. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, was kind of, I put it back on the uh, the axle, and I was noticing that it was proud even after I uh, put it together. And then pulled it off, took that bearing back out again, just to make sure that I had it seated properly, and then then uh, put it back in. Still had the same thing. So yeah, I was a little curious about that. If you kept the old bearing and you have a micrometer, you can check your heights, make sure they're at the same height, but bearings manufacturing clearances are to the hundred thousandth of an inch of the, you know, yeah. numbers are very precise. And uh, unless it's a totally wrong bearing, it's unlikely to be uh, something like that. Okay. And um, of course you can always take that spacer and make him thinner, right? <laughs> Machine it down a bit, yeah. Well, you know, just put him on a, on a on a belt sander and just just keep keep even and just keep checking it in four spots and try to take off three thousandths. That's not much. No, it's not. Okay, keeping it even might be a little difficult on it. Well, that's why you keep checking it with the Cali that and the paint <laughs> pencil, you know. So yeah. So. Sure. All right. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Well, hey, thanks thanks for weighing in. So, where are you from, Mark? Uh, Ventura, California. Oh my gosh, where it's always eighty degrees. It was close to it today. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. So. John. Yes. Hi, yeah. It's Howie in, in uh, England. Oh, so this, this is Howard Brooks. I worked That's with Howie when, when I worked with in, um, in at University Motors in Hanwell, West 7, London, right. from 72 and 73. That's a yeah. in the there now? <laughs> That's a few pints ago. Yeah. <laughs> I say, do you remember the uh, other names for the hammer we used to use? No. Birmingham, Birmingham screwdriver. And the persuader. A persuader, yes. <laughs> you know, I, I talked about a, a, a guy who's got an MG shop, a repair shop, and he's got a big sledgehammer. I mean, this thing's got a two and a half, three foot handle and it's got a 10 pound um, end on it. I mean, it is a massive, massive sledgehammer. And off the side of it, it says midget 1500 repair tool. Um, midget 1500s are, are, are very difficult to work with in the shop for about a thousand reasons. Um, so anyway, that's, that's uh, I, I know we've had a lot of midget 1500 people in here today, so that's embarrassing to even, even bring that up now that I think about it. But anyway, yeah, the persuader, yeah, the, and then there's, uh, there's you know, that's the, the old joke when you go into the tool store and you tell the guy behind the counter, yeah, I just bought an MG and I, I wanna buy some tools, what's the first tool I should buy? 
and the guy comes out with a hammer and then you go, okay, I, I get it, funny. All right, so what's the next tool I should buy? And he gets a bigger hammer. So That's it. <laughs> so if you, yeah. got a, if you got a, like a three pound hammer and a ball peen hammer and a little tiny, tiny gasket hammer and a brass hammer and a dead blow hammer for get, or, or lead, for getting the spinners off. That, that's about all, this, all the hammers that you really need. That's Unless the one, you yeah. Your work. Then you want a right. soft hammer, a, a, like a rubber hammer, something like that, a wooden ham, hammer that you can tap um, along on, on, uh, oh, on the, high, uh, the uh, draft excluder around the door or something. So where, where do you live, Howie? Copper, no throat oh. shit. Okay. So, not not too far from uh, no, Whitby. Mm, that's right. Yeah. So Whitby yep. is the home 20, of Captain about Cook. About twenty miles. Uh, Captain Cook came from Whitby, and that's also where Dracula, in the original story, enters England. Yep. Is through Whitby. That's right. Well, in in um, April, um, I do what I call golf weekend, and we all dress up like. No, with um, black goths. You have to look it up on the on the on the uh, on the tinting net. Very cool. Been, yeah, been in the paper with it as well. So, so what what time is it there? It is mm, quarter to two a.m. Oh, so you're you're on Zulu time there? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yep. All right. Well, hey. Yeah. My, my stick's in the eye, so I'm going to go to bed in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for weighing in tonight, Howie. It's a real pleasure to, to, to see you again. So, and you too, John. Thanks for Take posting care. on that on the Facebook page. You stay safe. All right. See ya. See ya. Bye, folks. After after Howie comes, Rich Caldwell. So, um, um, he says, you uh, you know, I sweat the details on my fifty three right hand drive TD. And at 6'5", I'm, I'm not comfortable in the car. Feels top heavy. I'm thinking of selling it. Since, it was my, uh, since my restoration was bent on original, and I even replaced all the BSF and Whitworth fasteners, do you think there is a desire for such a car in the UK? And if so, how would I, how would, how would you sell it? How would you get it back to the UK? Well, how we can buy it. Wait. Um, yeah, actually, it's from Leeds. And I still have the original tax tags on it. Uh, so I, you know, lights. I don't know whether T types are are uh, are hot in England or not. I mean, uh, there was the drain. You know, like fifty years ago, you could buy them there, just dirt cheap, and bring them here, and it was a better deal. And then it reversed for a while. But I, I, I don't, I don't know whether T types are are. Uh, I don't what know. would you do? I have this romantic notion that it belongs back in the home country. The um the resellers, you know, the people that the the auto auctions, because those guys advertise, you know, that someplace with two or three hundred cars under one roof or something, and and just consign it because they have all those contacts. Now, if you wanted to be really fun about it, you'd run an ad in the back of enjoying MG or safety fast. And you'd put the original registration number in it, and and make a pitch for originality and so forth. But then, so the guy calls you and you establish a price. But how do you get it there? I mean, it's just the logistics. Are. So anyway, that's that's why a consignment shop. They, you don't have to worry about it. That's what they do. We uh, we had a gentleman from uh, Scotland bought a right hand drive TD here in Florida and brought it in to me to restore, and it was, there was nothing left. There was no car there. There was no wood, no metal, no interior. There was no car. It, I, maybe we could take the engine out of it and just crush the rest of it. And he insisted that he was gonna send that back to Scotland and get it restored. And I just said, I, I, don't, I don't understand, sir. I mean, take $25,000 and go buy one and ship it back. What, and he, no, no, I was wrong. I was wrong. And he got that car and 
used that puddle of rust and rotted wood and shipped it back to Scotland to be restored. So apparently they want the right-hand drive cars back there no matter what they look like. <laughs> oh, there's no answer for you here, Rich, exactly, but. All right, well, thank you for considering it, my question. Hard to, hard to believe that's where the Industrial Revolution started was in Scotland. So where did it start in the United States, John? Okay, Rich, I don't know. You tell me. Eli Whitney and the Cotton Gym? I don't know. Near, near Easton, Pennsylvania, where they had both iron, charcoal, and most importantly, canals. So, sorry. Okay. That's okay. That's okay. I posed the question. So. Right. Hey, thanks. Thanks a lot. So now we're going to go on to um, Rich, who says, I'm installing a new wiring harness in my 77B, and there, there are extra wires, uh, two green wires. Which one, is, which one is the thermostat? There are extra gray wires. What are they for? Any other suggestions? And how do I, how do I install a new convertible top on my car? So we've got a wiring question, and those are always fun because they're so intense. And, and, the, um, and the other one is how to install the top. So I'll do the wiring and Glenn will do the top. So the wiring, there are two green wires underneath the bonnet. One is green with blue. It has a blue tracer on it, maybe faint, but blue. And that's the one that goes to the temperature sensor on the underside of the thermostat and goes to the temp gauge and, and reads, the, it reads the resistance in the, in the temperature sending unit. And, and then the gauge moves back and forth depending on how hot the car is. The other one is a much longer one. Maybe this is the one we're dealing with, often sheathed in black, uh, that goes all the way over the top of the engine, plugs into the manifold heater, which is part of the emission control device from 1975 through 1980. So one wire might be, I don't know, long enough to reach just above the alternator, but the other one's got another eight inches on it or so and can go all the way over the top of the engine or in front of the valve cover. I don't know if, if those are the wires that we're talking about, Rich. Um, and the gray wires are a gray, aren't gray, Rich, they're slate. And they're, they're referred to on the diagram with an S for slate. And slate with purple or slate with yellow has to do with the anti-run-on valve. That's the circuit that's hot when the key is off. And then off when the key is on. So um, if, if Rich, if you're on here, you can send me a note. I can send you the exact wiring diagram for the 77 federal spec MGV Sometimes if you get a generic wiring diagram, it's not quite clear enough where you can call. And um, yeah, Well, John, uh, my B has been really modified. I don't have any of the pollution stuff on it or anything so, like that. So just coil it up and don't use it. Sounds good to me. <laughs> so, so it's, but it's anyway, good. it's been really, it's been really challenging to do this, you know, so doing it a bit at a time. You, you put a V8 in it or what? No, no, I just uh, had a lot of problems over the past two years with uh, stuff blowing fuses and other things were just doing really weird stuff in the car. So last year I replaced the alternator in it. And uh, so then from there on, I thought finally, okay, this is enough and not this. I decided to put a new wiring harness in it. So I've been tackling it for the past like, you know, month or so. Kind of thing. So what I did was lifted the whole wiring harness out of the car with everything still intact in the car. <clears throat> and then when I put the new one in, I just kind of transferred everything over to what I had. So right now I've got everything done underneath the hood and I'm waiting to push it through the firewall into the cockpit itself. So. Tom, tell them about that 77 wiring change. That's that one year only for the fuse box and the so, uh, ignition relay. There, because, of, because of the electric fans on the car, those draw more current than anything else in the car except the starter motor. Um, and um, so they, they put an ignition relay 
in the car, in your car, it's the, it's the cylindrical relay that lies to the forward side of the fuse box. Yeah. And everything that runs through the, you know, everything that runs through the car when you turn the key on, except for the fuel pump and the overdrive um, or the TCSA switch, one or the other, um, that all runs through that ignition relay, including in 1977, the ignition coil. So if that relay fails, the ignition fails. And the other problem is that if the anti-run-on system is hooked up, but you said your, yours is, is greatly modified, but if the anti-run-on system is not working, and if you've still got all the original um, carburation, it's possible to turn the key off, pull the key out, and the car continues to run. This isn't dieseling, it's just plain running. Yeah, yeah. That's, what, that's what happens. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, on a 77, there's a, there's a wiring change that you can make at the relay uh, so, that the, so that the ignition circuit runs. Um, it's a specific change. Glenn, what's the, what's the, you get a brown and white and a white. I, I have a PDF that I can email okay. you. That's All right, so email Glenn. That requires the change to, to prevent okay. that. Get Glenn's um, email off his website or 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 something, and, and uh, he'll he'll send you the, the PDF on that. It's just one little tiny wiring change that you have that's to make. Yeah. The wire gets moved from the fuse box to the relay, and that's what they did in '78. Very simple. So the first the, the first month or two of '78 still had that same problem, and uh, and they recognized it and then made a wiring change. So yeah, so who knows whether. The car was in really bad shape when I got it, and I've done a lot of maintenance on it, so to speak, you know. And there was only one fan left in the car, and it ran intermittently. So I had to, at one of your meetings down in uh, Grand Rapids there, I had to install a new fan into it. And I got one from a, um, an RV dealer near you, and I installed it at that point. And so now that I'm rebuilding everything, I've got, I've had to modify the wires that went to the yellow fans to the fan that I bought down in Grand Rapids kind of thing. So I don't know if it's gonna work when I start this thing up. I figure I'm gonna to have to do a lot of uh, tracing, so to speak. 12 volt what's test light. What's not and everything kind of thing. Throw throw your meter away and just get a 12 volt test light. That's that's the greatest tool. <laughs> that's the greatest tool that you, you can have. So now I'm okay. just gonna tell you how to put the soft top on. <laughs> I don't know if I can do that in less than an hour and a half. <laughs> you have an hour and a half? <laughs> okay, well, thanks a lot. <laughs> hot. Do it outside when it's hot. Oh yes. Oh and, yeah, um, well. I'm right now in Harriston, Ontario, and outside it's, uh, we're in Celsius, so it's like minus six, minus seven, which I guess down here, guys, is, I don't know, 20 degrees? I'm yeah, guessing. yeah. Anyway, it's freaking cold. <laughs> yeah, you're not calling that top unless it's 60 or 70 degrees outside, uh, because okay. it's just, it has to warm up and it has to stretch for you to put it on, so uh, start okay. with for summer. All I can say is bring on spring. <laughs> I'm going to be so happy when the border opens up. Oh my gosh. I, yeah, want to go no to, kidding. I, I go up to Toronto um, every other year or so and do a tech seminar for the club there. And it's just, oh my gosh, you know. <laughs> anyway, anyway, thanks. Yeah, we want to go down to Atlantic City. So hurry up and get your COVID under control. Eh? Okay, but I read that the GTA it was swept. It's I I was on I was on a private Zoom with a with a Toronto club, and somebody with you know sort of puffed up and said, "Well, you know, we only had we only had three cases in the GTA this past week, and Michigan had had twenty thousand or something." It was like we were doing something wrong. But then more recently, I'd read that that there was quite a problem in, the, in that Toronto area. So. Yeah, well, yeah. we don't talk about. It. We don't talk about Toronto where I live. <laughs> All right. Thanks, John.
Okay, hey, thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. From Glenn, it says, one of my winter projects is to install a convertible top. What hints can you offer to make this easy? Don't, wait till summer. That's the, <laughs> that's, that's the line. Really, it, it's, it, it just has to be um, nice. So Alan uh, Shoshone, I have the 64 MGB and I had the trans. Yeah, I, I have a 64 MGB and um, I had the, the car rebuilt and uh, the trans was uh, rebuilt. And previously I had a problem uh, shifting uh, from first to second. And after they rebuilt this transmission and supposedly went over it with a fine tooth comb, I'm still having the same problem. Is there uh, a, a synchro gear or some other uh, they may have problem been. that I don't know about? The, uh, the, the second gear synchro is the weak point in, a, in, a, um, in the earlier boxes. About 65, they went to a steel synchro in second. And oh my gosh, it's just great. I've got a steel synchro in my MGA. I re retrofitted it. It's just great. It works forever. Just like a, a, a newer MGB, an all, all synchro box. But those brass gears wear out. And the problem has been that the new synchros don't work out of the box. And you have to lap them into place. Now, will the transmission shop know that? Probably know. not. Probably not. But it probably means that the engine... It more than probably means that the gearbox is going to have to come back out, out again. Usually, well, the yeah. I, usually I the said, you know, I, I want this fixed. Uh, you know, yeah. uh, I'm expecting the, to, this thing to work, not like it worked before. And they claim that they checked all of the specs on and everything was up to spec. But I have a feeling they did not lap it in. And perhaps that's the problem. So you can always ask those kinds of shops to call someone who knows more than they do about that specific gearbox. There's a lot of prima donnas and they won't, they won't call. They, they, they absolutely, they, they stiffen their backs and they say, no, yeah, I know what I'm doing and I don't have to talk to anybody else. But if they want to talk to somebody, they can talk to me, they can talk to Glenn and, okay. and we'd be more than happy to, to tell them what to do, how to look for the bad part, so forth. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Hey, where, where, where are you? Uh, oh, I'm in Woodstock, Illinois, which is about 90 miles northwest of uh, Chicago, uh, about 15 miles south of Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, right on the Illinois. We, every single one of us has seen Woodstock because we've seen Groundhog Correct. Day in the city, city square and Groundhog yeah, Day. That's our, was, that's our square, and, 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 and there are a couple of... Uh, Houses, you know, that are uh, the uh, and and we're the Groundhog Festival is coming up on February second, and uh, so come on to Woodstock. We we're we're going to be celebrating Groundhog Day. All right. Okay. My, uh, uh, you got a guy in Rockford, Lynn Pond. Yeah, I, that's who we built my car. And uh, okay. All right. Lynn, uh, you know, well. I I talk to Lynn a lot, so I'll say something to him too. I'll suggest he call you. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. And my daughter lives yeah. in Crystal Lake. Otherwise, I wouldn't know anything about Woodstock. So. I see. Okay. So from iPad 2, we've got a comment here that Boeing used hammers as final adjustment tools. So, it, yeah, I mean, it sounds like a joke, but it probably is the truth. So, so, um, Mr. Yoakum, uh, I, you can unmute yourself here. And he says that I've got a 74B yes, that keeps backfiring through the exhaust, but the backfiring comes and goes. Now, a backfire is a rifle shot. Go bam, bam, bam. Is that what you're getting? John, it's more of a pop. It's a, it's a popping sound. On deceleration? on when I shift from like second to third and then like wind it out in third gear and then shift down to fourth, it pops during the shifting process. Do you still have the air, the emissions air pump on the car? Yes. Okay, that's the problem. Um, 
I mean, that's, that's, that's where the problem is. So the, the easy solution is to take it off. Car runs better without it, looks better without it. But if you're Mr. Original and it's like, you know, you, for whatever reason, you, you have to have it there, then we got to work with the amount of fresh air that's getting pushed into the exhaust during that time. There's a restrictor that looks like a bullet that lies in the hose that, that goes from the air pump to the gulp valve. And it reduces the inside diameter of that hose from half an inch down to, I don't know, three sixteenths of an inch or something. They that's like a slug that's in there? It's a, it's like it a looks like a slug. bullet. Looks like a yeah. bullet with a hole through it. Mm -hmm. Now you can just plug that hose off with a ball bearing on the inside and that'll probably take, take care of it. But then the air pump is gonna hiss a little more um, because it's got a blow off valve. So if you want it all to work, then we got to talk to Glenn because he's got the machinery that tests all that stuff. And I always just took, took the stuff off. I mean, I, I, I solved the problem, but that was yeah, like- uh, We have a customer who, uh, he wanted to keep his air pump on, but he didn't, he wanted to fool people. So he took a belt and he cut it and he glued it into the groove of the pump. So it looked like there was still a belt on the pump. Problem solved. Power stop backfiring. Your problem is actually the anti-backfire valve is bad. And whether or not they even sell those anymore, I, I have no idea. But they usually went bad still under warranty. Um, and its purpose is to, uh, when you take your foot off the gas during a shift, you mm -hmm. the intake has to suck some fresh oxygen in, but only for a half a second. And that back the anti-backfire valve was called a gulp valve because that's what it did gulped a bit of air for a moment and uh they're always bad i don't know if they sell new ones if you can find a new one and put it on that would most likely cure that problem if you've got to keep your air pump still in the car okay very um, good gentlemen we've got we've got one guy who who comes to the all the nam namgaber events with an le it's just stunning he always gets first place and he gutted his air pump. He just he took it apart, took the veins out. So it, all, it spins, looks like it works and everything, but it doesn't. So, you know, it, nice. it just, yeah. okay, where, where are you? Very good. Uh, I live west of Philadelphia, about 20 miles near uh, Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. Okay. I'm a member of the uh, Delaware Valley MG Club. Great, we got lots of people from PA today. Lots of midgets too, for some reason, but um, yeah, PA, got lots of people from PA in California. So mm -hmm. thank you very much for oh, asking your question. Thanks for uh, the invite, appreciate okay. it. So now we got Judd, we got Judd back again, who said that he swapped his HIFs uh, for HS6 carburetors, much simpler carburetor, took a little bit of fiddling to, to, to make it all work, but it, 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 it worked out okay. Um, I, my gut is that HS6s are grossly over carburating the car. You need a certain speed of the air to go through the carburetors for, for um, evaporation. And it's hard to do that with an HS6. It doesn't make the car run in any faster at high, high speed. Um, maybe right. that's all Judd had there available. Or maybe that was that. it. That was, that's what I had, okay. the HS6s. Yep. Uh, I agree with you uh, that the, the engineers knew what size the hole was supposed to be. I don't understand why a Volvo B18, which is an MGB engine in a mirror, um, with the advantage of a gear on the, uh, instead of a chain on the, on the cam, but other than that, it's an MGB engine, except made backwards. Um, and they used inch and three quarters. I, I don't understand why. Maybe because the air is denser up there, isn't it? In Sweden, I mean, it's colder. All right, from Dale's iPhone. Uh, hey, John, here in Canada, we also use a Robertson screwdriver. Another good Canadian invention. So is this, is, uh, Dale, is this another euphemism for a hammer? 
Bob's my uncle caught me unawares. That's something which is I can't t- begin to tell. So, yeah, Dale, what's the scoop? Can you hear me, John? Oh, just barely. So speak up. Okay. Just, no, just to let you know, you were talking about you and me. I can't, I, 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 I can't hear you. So, okay. too, bad, too bad. Something up with your microphone or something. So, okay. but you can um, get your microphone sorted out and come back next week and tell us what a Robertson screwdriver is or where, where the joke lies. So, Larry Maselli, we're on next. Larry, any trick to removing a clutch cover plate on my 64 midget 1100? No, MG 1100, not a midget. Excuse me, I don't know what I said. I MG 1100. So the, the, the problem is that you, um, is it, it's rusted into place or something? In, in uh, no, it's, it's, it's running, it's, it's, uh, but it's the original clutch that's in there. And uh, it's what they call a pre-verto clutch in those uh, front wheel drives. Yeah. Uh, and there's a special tool, a puller that they use for it. And uh, we've got that and have tried everything that so I can. You're trying to change, you're trying to change the clutch. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you put a wheel puller, you know, with the three fingers on yep. it. You put one of those on, on that nut. Um, and, and you use a, like a 5 16 or 3 8 nut on top of the big bolt yeah. so, that, so that you don't ruin that, that pinpoint on it. And it also gives you a center location. You, you tighten that thing up as tight as you can. Grill comes out. Starter motor comes out. You get a, a real good, like a half shaft, a half shaft size thing. Put it through there on the, on the engine side of the flywheel and use your use your big hammer and crack it up. The flywheel pops right off. All right, so I, I need a bigger hammer is what you're saying. Yeah, in, in, that, in that distance too. What, what do you say, Glenn? Uh, yeah, the, uh, that's, that's a tapered shaft, that crankshaft, and that's, that's why that's on there that tight. Uh, same as the back of a TR6 axle or a Spitfire axle, and, and they need, uh, uh, they need the regular puller. If you could swing a hammer, and smash the end of the bolt of the puller that would pop off. But of course, in the 1100, there is no room. You just, you, that, that's all you got room, no way to get a hammer in there. So John's saying, bring the starter out and hit the back of the flywheel. You have to break that friction of the tapered shaft. And uh, uh, just pulling on it only makes it tighter. The puller just makes it tighter. You need that, that impact uh, to break that uh, tapered shaft. And some come right apart and some don't. Yeah, I own, my wife owns an eleven hundred. We've had it for many, many years. I've seen it. I've seen it many times. Yeah, <laughs> thank gosh I don't have to put a clutch on that anytime soon. Yeah. Hey, John. Yes. This is Jim. Jim. How are you? Hey, how are you? you? Good, good, good. Hey, I just had a similar situation with my Mini, where I couldn't get the flywheel off, and but the engine was out of the car. I had a puller on it, and I mean, I bent one, and I had to borrow a snap on. And when I did, I just want to warn everybody to don't stand behind it because it flew off and it dented my garage door. Yeah, you got to keep the nut on a little bit to retain it. <laughs> no, I, I know that now. <laughs> but but it, I mean, we tried two days, couldn't do it. I left it set overnight. It didn't move. And I cranked it and cranked it and cranked it. And I actually hit it with a hammer after I cranked it a little tighter. It flew off. And luckily, I just stepped away, and it hit my garage door and dented the door with the teeth. Okay. You know, dangerous. And by the way, Glenn, the modern, Bob Ash says hello. There's, there's a modern engine that uses that tapered shaft yeah. and has that same problem getting the flywheel off, and that's the Mazda Rotaries. All yeah. have those tapered shaft crankshafts, and we... That's a modern... Excuse me, that's a modern vehicle? What's that? That's a modern vehicle? Well, modern, you know... Compared to MPs, I guess. Did, um, Glenn, did, did did you hear the the uh, what Jim said about your, your uh, about the, your common friend, Bob Ash, um, from uh, Pennsylvania, okay. worked for you. Oh, okay. He's in he's in Florida right now. Actually, okay. John, you sent me a picture of those of you guys together. Oh, yes. Okay. yes, 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 yeah. yes, exactly. So, yeah, yeah Bob did some nice work for me. Yeah. He's a 
Good guy. He's down there now. Okay. Guys, I, I just wanted to tell you two more things. It's nice to see some young people who don't have gray hair and balding uh, <laughs> that are interested in these cars. And there is no uh, 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 Groundhog's Day in Punxsutawney this year. I got to go. See y'all. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jim. See you later, guys. Okay. All right. So we're, we're working on 9-11. We still have 103 people on. We've got more questions. I'm, I'm game. We'll stay on for a while. Uh, again, go to my go to my website when you can, you know, and press the PayPal button. That's so very, very kind. Thank you. So John Willie says, um, I'm adjusting the valve gaps on my TD. The manual calls for 19 thousands hot. Can I adjust them cold and at what clearance? So um, I always adjust them hot because that's the way they are when the car is running. You don't care what it is when it's cold. You only care what it is when it's hot. But I, I looked up uh, some time ago, I looked up steel and what the coefficient of expansion of steel was. And these push rods are the better part of a foot long. And I, I went from uh, zero Celsius to 100 Celsius, which would be the range of, of, of cold to hot in our engines. And the push rod expanded one ten thousandth of an inch. So I don't think it makes a difference if you do it cold or you do it hot. I've got a YouTube video up. It's like my video number seven. It shows you why you can adjust the valves so quickly. And I actually adjust the valves that quickly on a TF, the whole, the whole video, the explanation of why you can do it quickly and doing it is seven minutes long. So it, it's, it, watch that video and you'll know how to adjust the, um, the, the rockers very, very quickly. I use 15 thousandths on a TD. I just, that 19 thousandths is just so clattery. It just sounds like something's wrong underneath there. So tighten it up to 15. Triumphs run at 10 thousandths. I don't think it's because the cams are dramatically different from the MGs. It's just what their preference was, what their engineers put in their books. As long as there's any clearance, it's okay. But I don't know, two or three thousandths, that's, that's for overhead, overhead cams. So I, I run 15, 15 on T-types and A's and B's up until the 18, 18 V engines, and then I drop it down to um, uh, 13 thousandths on those because the push rods are longer. 15. So there's a story. John, thank you. You, you still here? Yeah. Here. Thank, you, thank you, John. Yeah, uh, I, yeah John will here. I, uh, I appreciate that answer. I've always uh, done the TDs hot, and but I've always done the B, MGBs cold, since it said to do that in the book. Um, anyway, I, so the question came up today, since I'm right in the middle of doing that today. Oh, wow, why, wonder, why can't we do it cold? And I uh, wonder if there's a set point, you know, a setting, but I appreciate the information. I might try the 15 on the TD. Try it. I had, I told the story once before on the same, on the Zoom that I had a guy years ago, 30 years ago, I had a guy call me from Vermont, Maine, someplace, New England, and he bought a TC new, and he said, it just drives me bonkers to drive it because it rattles so much. And yeah. I said, well, tighten it up, <laughs> move it to 15. And he said, well, yeah, but the, the brass tag says, um, you know, 19. And I said, dude, you're calling me, you know, <laughs> set it at 15. And he called me back like a day or two later and said, oh, my God, I love my car. I mean, this had to have been in the early 80s. I mean, he bought that car 30 years before that. And anyway, 15. <laughs> well, 15. I, I can pass this on. The first time I ever had a mechanic t tell me how to set the gaps on my TD back in about 1964, um, he said, you want it to rattle like a sewing machine. <laughs> okay. And, and I guess maybe that's what you're talking about <laughs> at 19. But anyway, I, I'm going to try the 15. 
if you're going if you're if you're going to be in a parade our cars are made to drive and drive fast they're not made for parades but if you're going to be in a parade you can open up your valve clearance to like 30 thousandths 40 thousandths and then okay. it'll tick over the idle down around 300 rpm um, <laughs> sounds kind of funny but but uh, it's it, you know and then of course to drive it home you want to make sure that the push rod doesn't pop off one of the rockers but anyway that's that's just an aside. Okay. Well, thank you for the answer. Yeah, you're welcome. So now we're going to go to their next question down from Walker um, um, Walker Eaton, and that's um, we we've already talked about that. These are our young man here, Dale's iPhone. For the person that needs the windshield washer tube um, back on, you just have to wait until you drop the whole dash. <laughs> Okay. All right. Sure. Okay. So from uh, Curtis um, on a free, we got uh, any ideas why a four synchro gearbox with overdrive would not go into first while moving? The synchro appears to be good. It's the steel synchro type. So why wouldn't it go into first while moving? Well, I guess only if the synchro is bad, but you'd know that when you changed. Well, of course, you're not changing from anything but second down into first. I mean, that's in not going in is very different from um, being afraid to put it into gear because it's making so much noise. Uh, uh, and, you know, that, that kind of noise. And it's really common, no, it's not common, it's not uncommon to have a synchro ring fail in an all synchro gearbox. It doesn't wear out the same way the brass ones do. It actually breaks. If you take the synchro in your hand and pull it, there's a gap um, that it actually breaks. So when it goes to fit over the cone on the speed gear, instead of grabbing it and, and holding holding the, the inside of the, holding the synchro um, fast for just a second, um, it just slips over and expands as it's going on to, to the speed gear. So Curtis, are you on? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, all right, so, so the problem with changing from second into first is that it grinds real badly. Yeah, it really it grinds really hard. Yeah, it's a synchro. So just, you know, it's not necessary. I mean, to do this, engine and gearbox come out. Um, if you were to take it to my shop when I was in business or Glenn's shop, easy two grand, you know, and you don't change from second into first much. So, so you just have to stop changing from second into first and you can save that 2000 bucks. And then someday when the clutch is bad or you know, the engine and gearbox come out for some other reason, that's the time to, to take care of it. Okay, I've got it all apart right now. Oh, okay, well, it's, it's a first gear synchro, absolutely. So take a hold of it, it's just, a, it's a circle, you know, and just pull it, pull it and you'll see a, a, a gap open up right next to one of the dogs. Okay, awesome. You've got that black, you've got that black surface on the gear face too that can be worn away. That's uh, that's kind of critical. Those gears, because it's a steel synchro, they have to grab a a uh, like a very rough sandpaper like surface on the gear on the cone, and that surface will wear away. And then even a new synchro won't do the job. Have you seen that on all synchro gearboxes? I have. We've been, I've been going through some big gear, used gearboxes like crazy, trying to find good gears. Really? Okay. Where they knock off. Yeah. That might be the problem with mine. Um, the overdrive unit, the um, cone gear, the surface completely disintegrated on one side, and I found that it was probably running for a while with that material running throughout the transmission, so maybe it sanded it down. Yeah. Look at all four gears. They should all have a real rough black coating on the cone. And if it's shiny metal, well, that gear's junk. You got to throw it away. You got to find a good used gear somewhere. I've been going through a lot of my transmissions trying to find good gear sets these days. No, I'll, I'll argue with Glenn straight up and say that no, I've never seen a black a black yeah. surface on on that, and they're always shiny on a on an all synchro gearbox. On the late on, well, on later cars. When you got the steel synchro, it should all look the same. Oh. What's that? 
they should all look the same. The back of the first motion shaft, third speed, second speed, and first speed gears, the cones ought to, ought to appear the same. So They should be black and rough, not shiny. Smooth and shiny. Mm, no, you're wrong. <laughs> okay. yeah, you know. I'll make sure that they all look the same, whatever they are, they'll all be the same. <laughs> they all be the same. <laughs> Do you guys um, happen to have any recommendations for guys around Columbus, Ohio, that work on this? Ohio has more MGs per capita than any other state. As a result, they have more people working on M MGs. Um, uh, the only guy I know of does pre-war stuff. I mean, he doesn't even do TDs. Um, in Mansfield, Ohio, safety fast restorations. Um, okay. But if you go on that Brit Car or Barney Gaylord's MGA Guru site, BritCar.org or mm -hmm. MGAGuru.com, um, the, I, I, there's got to be 50 repair shops in, in Ohio. Thank you. Thank you. How old are you? Uh, 40. <laughs> That's young in this crowd, man. So, <laughs> well, the car. The car's been in my family since before I was born, so. Very cool, yeah. very cool. Thanks a lot, Ron. Or no, you, you, no, I'm sorry, Curtis, thanks, thanks. thanks. Okay. So now we're on to Ron uh, DeYoung with a 62 MGA, has a vacuum line going from the inlet manifold to the, to the distributor. Uh, I believe the original system, in the original system, the vacuum uh, went from the H4, the SU, went from the SU to the ignition. Uh, what, uh, what is eventually the difference between these two and what has preference? Now, just a minute, I read this too quickly, but there's a vacuum line that goes from the bottom fitting on the carburetor, on, on the rear carburetor, um, over to the vacuum advance unit. Later on in the MGBs, that takeoff was was turned into a little tiny tip on the top of the carburetor. There's a bulb in the line originally, which is an anti-flash something or other. That bulb um, eventually fills up with gasoline. Um, but you can run just a, just a straight line from the carburetor to the distributor. You don't need to have the, the original bulbed line in place. Is that reasonable, Glenn? Uh, yeah, the, the bulb is, uh, it uses the heat of the engine to evaporate any liquid fuel that might get in that pipe, because that liquid fuel would go into the distributor and mess up the diaphragm of the advance. So, and, and so the orientation of that bulb is critical too. It's got to have, you know, the right side up, upside down, and it's attached to a bracket, picks up the heat. But yeah, I mean, if you don't want to use the bulb, you can run a straight vacuum hose to it. It's going to do the same thing. But I, I can't think of any MGA that would have had a, a vacuum fitting on the intake manifold going to the distributor. That would be technically incorrect. Hold on. You say, hi, this is Ron here. Okay. The, you say technically incorrect. Does that mean that it changes the whole system, that uh, it has effect on the engine? That's right, yes. because on the carburetor, there is no, there's no vacuum at idle if it's on the carburetor fitting. But if you put it on the intake manifold, you got vacuum at idle, you're, you're messing with the timing. Okay, good to know, okay. So they, they didn't change that, and again, that's all emission stuff. They didn't change that until 1972 and moved the vacuum port from the carburetor to the intake manifold where it's, where it's manifold vacuum which is highest on, on deceleration and, and idle. And it's just, you've got to have a distributor that matches that to make it work. So perhaps he has, uh, perhaps he has an MGB intake manifold and carburetors on his MGA. I've seen that done. Well, I think I have an MGA inlet manifold, only the bolts they put on, on, the, on the manifold. And from there, there's a pipe going to my ignition. So I have an MGB setup, let's say, on my MGA. Yeah, that's that's what I was thinking. You've got you've got MGB intake on there. Uh, do you have MGA carburetors or MGB carburetors? 
Are these studs at 12 and 6? Are two studs at 12 and 6 o'clock on the carburetors? Yeah, I think I have the normal MGA H4 carburetors. Yeah. Okay. So you, okay. you, you've got a port there that you can use instead. Yes, yes, yes. So yeah. where, where, where are you calling from, Ron? I'm calling from Pittsburgh. Okay, I was going to choose some more exotic place because of your accent, but. <laughs> yeah, I'm from Europe. I'm from the Netherlands. Okay. That's why I'm, I'm living now here in Pittsburgh. Great. Big classic car crowd in the Netherlands. Big classic car. Yeah. yeah. Big time. Thanks, guys. Hey, you're very welcome. Okay, Doug Wells uh, is written in and said, I removed the air pump belt from his 1980 MGB and it quit backfiring. Yes, that's because there's no longer any air pumped in. There's another situation though, without an air pump, on deceleration where you can get a pop, 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 pop down the, down the tailpipe. And that's because there's a leak in the exhaust and on deceleration, fresh air gets sucked into the exhaust and then combines with the exhaust gases and, and combustion continues down the exhaust pipe. So it isn't always an air pump. It can be a leak in the exhaust system too. So here from Glenn to everybody, um, he says, um, I had a similar second, third gear problem with my 62 MGA. Um, the diagnosis was that I lost a bronze spacer on the, on the, on the main shaft, resulting in the gears floating and it wouldn't stay in place. So I, I've never heard of one of those breaking up in, in service, um, but there's all kinds of stuff that can go wrong. And like Glenn says, um, when you take the gearbox apart, you've got to have some inkling of what this stuff is supposed to look like so that if it, if it isn't correct, you know that. There's a lot of stuff on site. You know, Barney Gaylord has got, I don't know, is Barney on tonight? Yeah, Barney's on here. How many pages, how many pages do you have on your website, Barney? Well, last time I checked, it was about 4,000 pages of technical information. And you got and you've got um, you've got lots of pages on on gearbox and pictures and stuff, probably. Yeah, there's a couple dozen pages on gearbox stuff. So anyway, Barney's got Barney's the MGA guru. He's the man, and uh, so there, there's information there. And there's all kinds of information um, when when that one gearbox comes apart and people try to figure out what's wrong with it. All right, so here we go. And Barney, where, where are you? Still in Florida? Yeah, we're sitting in Fort Myers, Florida tonight. Okay, all right. I can hear a background there, so you must be someplace where they got Wi-Fi, like McDonald's or something. Yeah, you got it. Okay. All right, Larry Maselli's checked in with us here and says, is there a trick to removing the clutch cover for my 1100? But we already answered that, thank you. A Robertson screwdriver is a square drive about a quarter inch square. This is Bob Connect who's, who's letting us know. So that's a, um, right. So we've got an answer on the Robertson screwdriver. Yeah, and they use it on, a, uh, they use it on uh, uh, in appliances. I've seen it uh, uh, on refrigerators and stuff like that. It, it, actually, I just looked it up when I saw it. I didn't know what it was either. Oh, but okay. I, I looked it up. It's, uh, it was invented by a guy named Robinson, who happened to the guy. The guy's correct. He's a, he was a Canadian. He invented this in 1908. Uh, they also use them. I think I had a couple of them on the the body of uh, my pop up trailer. They use it in in, in that industry out. In like square country. square drive screws. Square drive screws. Yeah, that's that's okay. all. It is. Okay. Now we know. Uh, here in the States, they use the Robertson screws on motorhomes, uh, travel yep. trailers, campers. Yep. Good talking to you, John. Hey, Bob, it's always, it's always a, a pleasure. So now we've had um, Judd has weighed in here and said, I've heard it suggested to adjust one valve hot and then let it all cool and check the gap and then adjust all of that, all of them, all of I'm tongue-tied because I've been on for two and a half hours. It's 9.30. We're going we're to call this, uh, bring this down here. 
I've heard it suggested that you adjust one valve hot and then let the whole engine cool and then go ahead and adjust all the valves cold to whatever that valve that you did adjust has has moved to. Right. Focus. Just, just do, do them all hot. Just do them all hot. That's, you know. Just... But wait, what about the MGB that's, the spec is 13,000 warm. What does warm mean? <laughs> is, that, <laughs> is that Fahrenheit or Celsius or centigrade? <laughs> Right, so I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to answer w one more question because we're at 9.30 and um, I just, I got to call it here. And um, anyway, I just, I want to add, tell everybody, the 77 people who are still on, thank you very, very kindly for, for coming on tonight. Don't forget to go to my website and push the PayPal button. All right, so now Dan McGovern, uh, my 77 midget 1500 rebuilt engine, 10 hours on it. Do I really need to retort the head? And if so, when? That means I have to remove the rocker arm assembly again, right? It's certainly not easy on the 1500. No, but changing the, changing the head gasket is a lot more complicated. So yes, you, when, you, when you rebuild an engine, uh, when we rebuild engines, we would bring them up and let, run them in for 20, 30 minutes at 2,000 RPMs, just let them run in, real wide valve lash, and then at the conclusion of that, retorque the head and readjust the valves, and off you go. So I don't know if that was done, but if you haven't, re if you haven't retorqued the head, Dan, after starting it up, yes, you absolutely need to. So when so you build it, Silly old story. I I worked at the Leyland dealership, 1975. It's kind of right around. I started, and we had a couple of guys at dealership that would only do the visible head nuts during the thousand mile retorque service. They would never do the ones underneath the rocker rocker shaft. Just too lazy. And boy, did those things blow gaskets quick. Woo! <laughs> so. So it, it's real easy, you know, that, that valve assembly just comes off of those four, four, uh, what are those, three-eighths nuts, and, uh, or um, nine-sixteenths yeah, when you're yeah. getting the socket on them. Just lift it off, just, just the way it is, jiggle it so that the push rods don't come up and lift the lifters up too high. And, and, uh, and then when I, when I torque the nuts, it doesn't matter if they're been on there fresh or they've been on there for 30 years, if you just start to turn the nut, you've got all kinds of stuff going on. So I, um, as far as friction, I back that I one nut at a time. Never have one more one nut more than one nut loose at a time. Back it off, oil it, pull it down to torque, go to the next one. Back it off, oil it, pull it down to torque. Oil under the nut itself. Hmm oil under the nut itself? Well, you, you back the nut off far enough so that when you, when you put some oil in there, it puddles inside there. So it gets on the, on the nut and on the stud. Okay, so basically I need to do it now is what you tell me. <laughs> so. Yes. Okay, fantastic. And I did yeah. send Glenn an email. I figured that was easy to try to call him. Oh, morning. good, good, good. Yeah. And, then, yeah, and then the valve lash on the midget 1500s, 10,000s. Yep. Because well, I had it all set now, but I guess I got to do that all over again. <laughs> that valve is cold. 10,000 is cold. Yeah, 10,000 is cold. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> well, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if Crystal's still on or not but from Texas, but thank you very, very kindly for uh, tuning in. We'll do this again next week on Monday. And and uh, just, I, you know, I don't know how many more questions there. It says 54 new messages. Does that mean we didn't get to 54 messages? I just, I, it's, it's all we can do, all we can do is, is the ones that we have time for. And I know it's frustrating if you've waited all this time and you haven't had your question answered. So call Glenn tomorrow. No, I can't. <laughs> call. <laughs> payroll to make by Friday. Call, call me. Uh, and I'm, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to answer whatever it is that you need. And if I don't know, then you can call Glenn and he can tell you that the, the gears have got a black face on them. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you, so, John. Have a great <laughs> evening. Um, thank you very much for tuning in, and, and uh, uh, you can unmute yourself if you want now. Uh,
uh, and it'll be just as it gets noisier, no, noisier, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see. Thanks, you John. See you later. Thanks, Thanks John. Take care. Thanks, John. John, thanks very much. You're welcome. Barney, thank you very much. For Have a good one, John. Thank you, John. John. Thank Barney and thank you, Glenn, both. You got, uh, thanks, thanks, John. Thank you, Glenn. Thanks, Crystal. Thanks, Crystal. Good night. Yep. Good night. Thank, you. thank you, Crystal. Okay. George, yeah. Barbaria, I see you on there. So thanks for being on tonight. Mark, thank you for being here. And Curtis, thanks. David, David Rem, David Massey, Doug McLaren. Thank you, John. And um, Dennis Campbell. John, appreciate it. With no last name. And, and uh, thanks. Ron, Ron Kuno. All right. So you, you've heard the story about the, about the, the gearbox. So I know I'll hear more about this tomorrow. Um, so and we get Doug and, and, um, and A32090809. Um, yep, so I'm Greg Swartley. Anyway, thank you everyone for being here. And I'm gonna I'm gonna push the uh, the end end button now. Thanks a lot. Look forward to seeing everybody next week. Hi, right, John. Thank you. Later. Thanks.